programs under the jurisdiction of the Interior Environment Appropriations Subcommittee. This morning we've heard um, great testimony, I just have to say, from a number of advocates for the arts and the humanities. We discussed some really real uh, critical environmental issues that are facing our nation. So this afternoon we're going to change our focus a little bit on issues related to our public lands and we'll be hearing from the remaining 20 minutes. Uh, 20 uh, witnesses. Um, before I begin, I want to uh, touch briefly on um, hearing uh, logistics. We have bills up on the floor. We have other committees meeting, both appropriation and policy committees in which our members are coming in and out of. Um, uh, everybody has your full testimony available to them. Mine's marked up with lots of great notes on it. Um, so um, no disrespect is, is, is uh, to be uh, felt at all by, by people coming in and out. Uh, what I will do is I'll call each panel up. We have our first panel already up here. Um, and uh, each witness will have five minutes to present their uh, testimony. Now we're going to use a, a, a timer in order to be fair. And um, when uh, the light turns yellow, it means you have one minute remaining. You should be concluding your remarks. When the light blinks red, um, one of us will gently tap the gavel and ask the witness to conclude their remarks so the next witness can begin. And as I said, five minutes goes really fast, but we have your full testimony loaded with lots of notes and we know how to get back to you if we have any questions. Um, there's very likely going to be votes called during the hearing, so we'll take a brief uh, recess for members to vote. And I hear, um, Mr. Joyce, there might be up to f four votes in this series. Yeah. So let's, let, let's hope not a lot of votes are, are asked for right away. Um, we're going to come right back and uh, we'll pick up where we left off. Um, but I would ask witnesses to stay close to the hearing rooms um, during the rest of this for votes. And we have two able-bodied staff members if you uh, need to know where to go for, for a quick cup of coffee that won't take you too far off the beaten path. They are very happy to help you with that. I'd like to remind uh, people here in the hearing room that the committee rules prohibit the use of cameras and audio equipment during the hearing by individuals without House-issued press credentials. And with that, I'd like to turn to... Um, my dear friend, Mr. Joyce, for any remarks he'd like to make. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would just like to re reiterate what I said this morning. I look forward to working with you during the FY 2020 appropriations process to evaluate the effectiveness of the programs discussed today and make those difficult but necessary choices among competing priorities in the interior bill, and I yield back. Okay. And with that, we'll start in our testimony um, right away. Um, uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Shepard, and if you'd introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, Chairman McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce. And, uh, my name is Ed Shepard, and I'm president of the Public Lands Foundation. The PLF is a national nonprofit organization comprised principally of retired BLM employees. Collectively, we have, our members have thousands of years of experience, expertise, and knowledge in public land management. We don't know what priorities are included in the president's budget for 2020. Uh, so our statement represents the priorities of the Public Lands Foundation. PLF supports BLM and his, and his programs, but we're independent in our views and requests. The BLM manages the most diverse landscapes in the nation's portfolio, providing stewardship to approximately 247 million acres of surface land, 700 million acres of mineral estate. And these lands provide many social, ecological, economic benefits to the people of the United States. Uh, economically, the country as a whole uh, received revenues in excess of $96 billion and 468,000 jobs in 2017. But these countries, uh, uh, these lands are vital to the rural communities throughout the West that these lands are intermixed with. PLF believes the BLM budget should prioritize programs to provide for a healthy, resilient landscape, conservation of species dependent on diverse habitats BLM manages economic benefits to the nation and rural communities dependent on BLM managed lands, all forms of energy production and associated transmission infrastructure, and the safety of the public and the communities these lands surround, including fire management and active forest and rangeland management to reduce fire risk and severity. PLS is supportive of a budget request that support the sustainable and balanced development of traditional and renewable energies, including solar, wind, and geothermal sometimes referred to as all of the above energy development. 
adequate funding should be provided to do the necessary land use planning, NEPA reviews and inspections and compliance monitoring. Another priority of PLF is the management of diverse habitats the BLM manages to provide for the conservation of species. The sagebrush steppe habitat is one of special concern. This particular habitat covers wide swaths of BLM managed lands across several states and is home to the greater sage grouse. The species has seen a population decline as the use of public land has increased and habitat alteration from wildland fire and development has increased. The, the BLM in conjunction with other federal agencies has worked with the affected state wildlife agencies to develop plans to conserve uh, the sage grouse and its habitat and PLF recommends that significant funding be provided to BLM to continue to work in lockstep with the state agencies. Th this work will uh, help reverse some of the losses from wildfire, weed invasion, and development. You know, the work will benefit not only sage grouse, but hundreds of other species. It also helps to maintain vibrant ranching communities dependent on these lands and a thriving and growing outdoor recreation economy. Another area of concern is the overpopulation of wild horses and burrows. Population on the range is past the critical point and it's doing irreparable harm to the land, vegetation and water resources, wildlife, livestock, and the horses and burrows themselves. And the problems and the damage continues to grow. The PLF has been working as part of a broad coalition of diverse stakeholders looking for solutions and we're cautiously optimistic that a long-term non-lethal solution can be found, but it's going to take a significant investment. This past summer uh, and, and fall, we all watched the terrifying and deadly wildfires in California and across the West. The loss of life and the damage to property and resources is unbelievable, and all studies seem to point to a continuation of this problem and a need for action. There are many communities across the West that uh, are potentially the next paradise. Active, more aggressive active forest and rangeland management and fuel reduction work needs to be done to address this. Uh, the President and Secretary of the Interior issued orders to do this and we're hoping that they'll be included in the budget, but we're asking that this committee, the subcommittee, uh, do what it can to help fund those priorities. We appreciate the, the hard choices that the subcommittee has to make. Everybody wants money, there's all a lot of uh, challenges that need to be faced that take a lot of funds um, and we are appreciative of your work uh, but these public lands are a good investment and we are hoping that you will consider those for the because uh, they're the lifeblood of the communities and provide a lot of economic development to the country and to uh, the local co counties in the west. Like with that uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions when you're finished with the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Baker, the Society of American Foresters. Good afternoon, Ch Chairwoman McCollum and Ranking Member Joyce. The more than 11,000 professional members of the Society of American Foresters appreciate this opportunity to share the Society's FY2020 priorities with you today. As a former federal employee who's recently accepted the SAF CEO role, in addition to being exciting to be here with you today, I have direct experience working to promote forest resilience on our nation's federal lands. Challenges exist, but if agencies are given the tools and the to have the capacity for targeted investments that yield a sustained return on investment, improvement opportunities abound. Founded by Gifford Pinchot in 1900, SAF is a premier scientific and educational organization in the United States, promoting scientific-based, sustainable management and stewardship of the nation's public and private forests. SAF always has more interest than may fit in four pages of written testimony or five minutes before you today. But here are the Society's FY2020 emphasis areas. Number one, increase USFS forest and rangeland research to no less than $310 million, with no less than $83 million for forest inventory and analysis. Number two, increase pace and scale of federal forest management to improve forest health and reduce wildfire risks. Number three, Maintain funding for USFS state and private forestry programs at or above the FY19 funding levels. And number four, 
Fund Bureau of Land Management, Public Domain Forestry, and Oregon and California Ro Railroad grant lands at no less than 10 million and 113 million respectively. In research, targeted federal investments leveraged through partnerships with universities and private public consortiums are critical to the future forest health and sustainability. Without this investment and USFS leadership, these needs would not be fulfilled. Continuing the trend of flat or reduced USFS R&D budgets will result in knowledge gaps, missed opportunities, poor management of resources at a time of unprecedented threats from wildfire, drought, insects, disease, and invasive species as well as the U.S. ceding its position as a leader in forestry research. SAF supports a funding level of $310 million for the USFS R&D, with emphasis on prioritization of research projects uniquely suited to R&D expertise furthering agency and partner objectives. In regards to forest health and resilience, SAF supports continued commitment to increasing the pace and scale of management on federal lands by setting aggressive but reasonable targets for harvest, reforestation, risk mitigation, and infrastructure improvements. SAF urges the subcommittee to encourage use of all tools to meet, out, meet and outpace forest plan goals. SAF is encouraged by the progress of the environmental assessment and decision making effort to streamline processes to improve forest and community resilience. We ask the subcommittee to support this effort and insist on continued focus on finding and implementing efficiencies. In regards to state and private forestry, the urban forestry and community, the urban and forestry community, I'm sorry, the urban and community forestry, landscape scale restoration, forest stewardship, and forest health management programs provide important technical and financial assistance to private landowners and the resources managers responsible for making more, managing more than 60% of America's forests. Cutting funding for these programs would have profound adverse impacts on communities, particularly rural communities, and will jeopardize the benefit forests offer to all citizens of this nation. SAF recommends that these programs be at least maintained at the FY 2019 funding level of $337 million. In regards to support of the Bureau of Land Management, Public Domain, Forestry, and Cali Oregon and California Railroad land grant, grant Lands, SAF also asked this committee to extend the Forest Hel Ecosystem Health and Recovery Fund authorization beyond 2020 and asked the subcommittee to also expand a 3,000 insect, 3,000 acre insect and disease categorical exclusion through designation of the Interior Secretary in coordination with the states to the BLM. SAF supports $10 million for the uh, public domain forestry program, and also uh, the ONC program. Finally, for healthy forests to thrive, we need trained professionals present to perform duties. A commitment to consistency in budget and appropriation cycles would be a tremendous help in securing that. Breaking the pattern of unresolved funding bills and continuous resolutions would improve the, the certainty resource managers need to meet the goals set before them. They can better plan for the field seasons, provide necessary direction and resource deployment to increase critical needs. In previous spending bills, Congressman McCollum and others have advocated for inclusion and report language recognizing the importance of participation in professional societies. For employee development, we appeal to this subcommittee to consider adding similar language in the 2020 bill. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so. You tell me how to say your name, and then I'll say it correctly. Ms. In Bergamo. In Bergamo. That's yes. it. That's, it's just, just like, like it's, it looks. Just like it looks, which you wouldn't believe what it looks like oh. to some people. <laughs> Good to meet you, Mr. In Bergamo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman and Ranking Member Joyce. My name is Bill In Bergamo. I'm with the Federal Forest Resource Coalition. And on behalf of our member my member companies and our partners around the country who rely on the Forest Service and BLM lands for our, our livelihoods, recreation, and water supplies, I want to thank the subcommittee for your leadership in addressing the challenges that face these important lands. My members purchase, harvest, and process national forest and BLM timber into products Americans use every day, from lumber to paper to biomass energy. In addition to, to, to supporting the budget, this subcommittee has displayed leadership on such issues as expansion of stewardship contracting, enacting the critically important fire borrowing fix as part of last year's omnibus bill, 
as well as fixes to the Good Neighbor Program and others. These provisions have all given the Forest Service many, but not all, of the tools it needs to increase the pace and scale of forest management and engage in shared stewardship on our national forests. Today, we implore this subcommittee to, to continue exercising leadership on the two issues that can do the most to improve the health and vibrancy of our national forests and the communities that rely on them. First, as some of my colleagues here have referred to, stable and timely appropriations are paramount to effective management of our public lands. Simply put, managing a $6 billion a year enterprise requires a thoughtful investment approach. Forest products companies plan and execute investment strategies over dozens of years, uh, and they can, those amortization schedules cover additional decades. Managing the national forests and BLM lands requires at least that much foresight. And while this subcommittee, and indeed this House, has routinely completed its appropriations bills in a timely fashion, ultimately the appropriations process has bogged down, delaying final allocation of the budget to the field. In the last decade, the Forest Service has been funded by more than 50 different funding measures, including continuing resolutions, omnibus bills, and full-year CRs. In four of the last 10 years, the final spending bill hasn't been adopted until at least midway through the federal fiscal year. This approach has not yielded savings to the taxpayer, nor has it helped increase forest management. It should go without saying, but for the sake, for the sake of better forest management, Congress should adopt timely appropriations bills by the start of a new federal fiscal year. Weeks or day-long CRs and shutdowns interrupt the normal course of business, as well as efforts to craft rules and guidance for the very laws this Congress enacts. And we want to do everything we can to help you return to regular order. Doing so will help the Forest Service plan and execute long-term forest management projects. Secondly, you can help rebuild the rural infrastructure needed to effectively manage our forests, as well as provide access for recreation and firefighting. By beginning to restore ca the capital improvement and maintenance budget, you can go a long way towards meeting this goal. Funding to maintain, repair, and replace aging roads has largely been flat since the 2013 sequester. Without the consolidation of the legacy roads and trails line item in the, 20, in the fiscal 19 fiscal year, current road funding would sit at about $178 million, or 21% below the unadjusted figure from a decade ago. Failure to adequately fund roads leaves forests less accessible and leaves forest values, including water quality, at increased risk. My industry largely built the road system on the national forests when the forest sold a much larger timber sale program. Even if they were to double from where they are now, that would still leave a significant unmet need for construction and maintenance. We're seeking a 9% boost in funding for the roads line item, and we hope that Congress will uh, include Forest Service roads as part of a rural, uh, rural infrastructure package if and when a, an infrastructure bill moves through this Congress. We also urge you to adopt a 4.6% increase in the timber program budget with a goal of a $4 billion board foot timber sale program. NFS timber is vital to my members' competitiveness and their ability to create jobs in our rural communities, including some in your home state of Minnesota. Congress should be aware that current forest plans contemplate a timber sale program more than double the current level, and my members all report to me that they're pressed for wood. That demand can help pay for needed management and restoration across much of the national forest system. Lastly, we appreciate this House taking action to repay the over $700 million in fire borrowing that took place during fiscal year 2018, and we'll be pressing your colleagues in the other chamber to follow suit. In conclusion, we appreciate the support the subcommittee has provided to the Forest Service, and my members are willing and able to compete for the increased timber outputs from that agency and the BLM. This competition can help the Forest Service meet important land management challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Murdoch, um, American Forest. Thank you. Chairwoman McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Alex Murdoch, and I am the Vice po President of Policy for American Forest. American Forest was established at a pivotal time in the nation's history, barely 10 years after the Civil War, during a period of tremendous development and industrial expansion. Forests were being cut down at an alarming rate to make way for new farms, towns, and railways, and timber barons were exploiting what seemed like an inexhaustible resource. 
Since that time, we have advocated for using science to manage and conserve our forest lands so they'll be with us and work for us for generations. We helped develop the U.S. Forest Service and the National Forest System. We funded over 1,000 forest restoration projects across the country. We've planted nearly 60 million trees, and we've expanded the tree canopy in dozens of major cities and urban areas. And we sincerely thank the committee for the FY19 funding levels which provide the Forest Service with important tools and resources to manage all of our nation's forests. But year after year, the nation is witnessing loss and destruction from wildfire at levels we have never seen before. And our forests are struggling to adapt to a new normal of extremes. Extreme drought, low humidity, high winds, shortened cold spells. And these extremes produce dramatic tree mortality and high intensity wildfire in the west, and changing tree species composition and declining forest health in the east. To adapt forests to this new normal will often require more active forest management, including harvesting dead and dying trees, reforestation, reintroducing <coughs> controlled fire, and other measures. More active forest management will require increased federal and private investment and a level of effort sufficient to halt this crisis. Consider California's forests where over 147 million trees have died since 2010, with roughly 85% of those located in Sierra Nevada. The best hope for sustaining forests like those in the Sierra will be to thin areas with dead and declining trees, while restoring a more resilient forests and using controlled burns more frequently. But it's not only in western forests, in southeastern <coughs> forests, we see a changing mixture of tree species in response to prolonged drought. And in New England, we see dangerous forest pests reaching farther north due to a changing climate. The fire funding fix was a critical step forward. It will free up federal resources to support forest restoration on America's national forests. But to adapt forests to this new normal, we must do much more. Yet federal funding for forestry assistance programs has declined over the past 15 years. Adjusting for inflation, FY18 funding levels were 32% lower than FY4 levels. So today we respectfully ask the committee to reverse this trend. In our written testimony, we've identified six Forest Service programs and levels of funding we believe are critical to addressing this crisis. The Forest Service is a critical partner and steward of our nation's forests. And if we act quickly and work together, we can help our forests adapt to the new normal. And then they will be with us and work for us for generations. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Joyce. Well, I certainly appreciate your, your uh, <coughs> all of your testimony today. And I, I agree with you. And there's only a finite amount of resources we have here, but uh, I'm sure that we'll be in a process to allocate them effectively. Uh, thank you. I yield back, Madam Chair. Ms. Pingree? <coughs> Sorry, I came in late and missed some of your testimony, but I'll look forward to reading it, and thank you for the work you're doing and certainly for highlighting the importance of sustainable forests and dealing with some of the challenges we have in um, wildfires and also you mentioned New England. Um, invasive species and bugs that we just don't want to see there anymore. So or we don't want to see moving in. Thank you. Stromedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm not a guy who says more money is the answer to everything. But I'm also the guy who says I think the last resource administration was the Teddy Roosevelt administration. So that's a very bipartisan criticism. <laughs> um, and, and I and I appreciate your, your testimony. Uh, it is confounding, especially in the part of the nation that I'm from where the federal government is the major land owner, that its stewardship of its estate and the resources there, now not all of them are forest lands, although thank you for mentioning the Sierra Nevada and, and the chair has, has, been, has been there and, and the ranking <coughs> member will get a up close and personal look at the Sierras uh, um, this weekend. and, and uh, the vice chair was supposed to come with the chair to, to visit uh, 
the sage hen folks, but that's not in the forest. But anyhow, we'll get that fixed up. They don't show up. Um, <laughs> and I guess the most frustrating part is this. What we spend on natural resources as a part of the federal budget is not extravagant or even a lot. And yet we continue to watch the funding trends go down. And so it's not like somebody's going to have to do without to even level that, God forbid, increase it. And the benefits paid in terms of relatively modest increases in the context of the federal budget is, as you folks have, have pointed out, is, is phenomenal. Um, and so I look forward, Madam Chair, under your leadership to uh, seeing what we do about those, those agencies and, uh, and, and giving them some money to do some serious management of the federal estate and the private estates on, in, in, the, uh, in the eastern part of the country. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pingree and I both uh, serve on the Agriculture um, Finance Committee, and you have a lot more expertise in, in that than I do for your years of service. But one thing that's come up a lot in the testimony that you'll see when you um, refresh it again is there's a lot of talk about uh, some of the, the language that was in the recent um, Ag Bill um, that was passed, the policy bill, and maybe we can take a look and see if we can uh, do, do some forestry work together on, on, on that jointly. So I look forward to, um, that's part of my learning curve, now being on the Ag Committee, and one of the reasons why I wanted to get on it was the interface between the, the Forest Service uh, being on both committees. Um, I would like to just get uh, a, few, a few thoughts from you. Um, forest resiliency water quality. Most of the times people don't think of forests and water going together. In northern Minnesota, we think of forests and water and around Voyagers National Park and around the Boundary Waters uh, Wilderness Canoe Area of going together. The Forestry Service owns what's on top of the soil, but then we deal with another uh, group below the, uh, the soil. And so I think understanding the impact on that between water um, and uh, the forest uh, uh, health and the quality of water is something we need to focus on more. But in the in the interest of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna narrow this down a little more and um, talk about climate change or the new normal or sea level rise or whatever what anybody wants to call it. We have to deal we have to deal with what's in front of us. Um, you mentioned uh, forest pests. Fire has come up again. Um, there was a startling map um, that was on the on on the. One of the front sections of the Star Tribune paper in in Minneapolis, Minnesota's paper, uh, Pioneer Press is St. Paul's, but this was in the Minneapolis paper, and it was a big you know map of what Minnesota looks like now with our force, and what Minnesota could look like you know 2025, 20, 2050. We are no longer a force state. So what are your organizations talking about? scientific information that is out there mm -hmm. that is, uh, you know, radically going to change. I mean, we need to work on roads. I, I agree with that. There's lots of things we need to do. But if we don't get our research right on climate change and what it's doing with pests and, and how we're watching the prairie come into Minnesota, um, what happens with our force? Can, uh, are there things that this committee should be looking at? Mm -hmm. If you could just give us one or two indicators, more money in research, we need to be addressing climate change uh, more if you feel comfortable t talking about it. And if some folks don't, and, and you might have a personal opinion, but you're here representing an organization. I'll start with you. Um, I'll just point to the, uh, in our testimony, the forest and rangeland research um, program. There is an incredible amount of research being done now through the climate hubs and the other areas of the Forest Service where they have this data and this information for decision-making purposes. But using that data mm -hmm. and plugging that into programs, we need the translation from theory to practice where we have uh, enough uh, assets within the Forest Service to begin to get um, practices on the lands that are following, that are pre-storing or preparing for us for the future climates that they will be encountering. So there's this, um, it's this terrible feedback loop where you, if you have the data but you can't use it, and you can't use it and then you continue to see problems on the landscape that you can't plan for. Um, and we'd like to reverse that trend by making sure that the uh, research line item is, is fully and strongly funded and then there are also implementation <coughs> funds available so that that data can be used. Thank you. 
we don't really touch on this in our testimony, but I can tell you that, you know, in, in other parts of the country that are more water constrained, in a lot of cases, the Forest Service has the most overstocked forest stands, and you've got three to 400 trees per acre in forests that are adapted to have 80 to 100 trees per acre. And, you know, it's, that's an artifact of past management decisions and aggressive fire suppression. And that's what leads to, in the case of, the, of, of forest fires, you know, pretty significant carbon emissions. Uh, I think we need to we need better research on what those emissions actually amount to, uh, and then we also need to help those communities uh, prepare by by getting those forests adapted, frankly, to the climate they evolved in and to the climate that they're going to be going to face. A lot of water authorities in the West have already dealt with this, where they they knew they had an overstocked watershed, they were unable to get it managed, and then the watershed burned, and it, and it cost the water authority and the ratepayers a significant amount of money to try to repair all that damage. Thank you. Mr. Baker? Sure thing. I think in our um, written testimony, we go in depth about uh, the importance of the research programs that, that are basically mm -hmm. um, the foundation is the U.S. Forest Service R&D program. Also, the, the Forest Inventory Analysis Program, and I think both of those programs are, are critical to, to at least creating the baseline data that infer a lot of the question that you, questions that you brought forward. Um, having worked in the West and worked in Colorado recently where uh, Mr. Bergamo um, talked about the impacts to water utility, uh, water companies, um, this is a reality, and, and I, I agree with you. It's one that's a big challenge. But, um, but the strong funding of research and the ability to at least have the baseline foundation and through the force inventory analysis, that actually gives us the ability to say where, where are we seeing changes? You know, are insects spreading? How fast are they spreading? What are, you know, to, to at least create a timeline and a projection of how we can try to get in front of them and what are the tools that we can get in front of them with? Um, or how prairies are, are moving into forested areas. So um, the dedication and funding at the, at the levels we requested or even at higher levels would be significant in maintaining that work so that we can at least have the baseline data to, to get in front of some of these things. Thank you. Mr. Shepard? Uh, building and, and maintaining resiliency in the forest it really answers both the climate change and the water issues because it has, uh, has already been spoken to uh, a resilient forest at the right species at the right stocking levels releases a lot of water in, into the system uh, and also uh, reduces the risk and severity of wildfires when they do hit and they are going to hit we're not going to stop wildfires but when we they do struck we need to have a opportunity to, to uh, manage those fires, to suppress those fires, and, and keep the damage on the ground to the uh, least amount that would possible, you know, and provide for the, for the ecological needs of the forests out there. So uh, resiliency is, I think, our forests need for a number of uh, things, climate change and water and air and carbon. Um, Mr. Shepard, just a quick uh, follow-up on, on in your written testimony. Um, at one point, well, I don't know where the situation lies right now with Acting Secretary Bernhardt's confirmation and, and moving forward. Uh, as we know, uh, Secretary Zinke was looking at doing a, a massive reorganization. Um, it, in your testimony, if I'm reading this right, only 3%, 3% of the workforce of BLM is in D.C. and it kind of fluctuates in and out, going in and out. If you just talk about the D.C. workforce just for a second to make sure that I understand it correctly. I've heard different things from different people. Yeah, it, it, the number is somewhere around 3 percent and of course it, it changes uh, almost daily. But uh, primarily uh, the functions for BLM in the Washington office is budget, uh, policy, oversight, uh, working with the Hill, uh, working with other uh, stakeholders like folks at the table here. Uh, and, and those belong in the Washington area, in, in our view, with PLF. Um, we, uh, we, we don't support moving the organization west. Um, the decision, we have most of the folk in the west now. The decision making is authority rests in the west. Okay. Uh, and we just need to uh, maintain the structure we have here. That's not to say that some people couldn't be moved west, but for the majority, we think ought to be left here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much.
Good afternoon. Uh, well, appreciate your being here today. Uh, we'll start and recognize uh, Ms. Zonley for five minutes. <laughs> for the opportunity to submit recommendations for fiscal year uh, 2020. My name is Cameron Onley and I lead uh, the U.S. Government Relations Team for the Nature Conservancy. The Nature Conservancy is an international nonprofit conservation organization working around the world to protect ecologically important lands and waters for nature and people. We'd first like to thank those on the subcommittee who have worked with the Conservancy on policy initiatives and on the ground efforts over the years. Chairwoman McCollum, you are a longtime champion of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and we appreciate your advocacy for LWCF dollars to facilitate the buyout of state school trust lands in the Boundary Waters Canoe area. Those purchases have helped make this iconic recreation area, enjoyed by visitors from around the globe, healthier, stronger, and whole. And just this past August, you, Ranking Member Joyce, visited our Grand River Conservation Campus in Ohio. Uh, we are grateful for the time you took to see some of our work uh, restoring habitat and improving water quality around Lake Erie and to talk to us about the threats to the Great Lakes. These are just two examples of the many partnerships we have had with members of the subcommittee, partnerships that are essential to continuing the kind of conservation work our country needs, and we look forward to working with all of you in the years ahead. As we enter into this new budget cycle and another year of challenging fiscal environment, our budget recommendations reflect a balanced approach and funding levels consistent with fiscal year 2018 and fiscal year 2019 funding levels. Our written testimony details our full budget recommendations, but I will highlight just a few examples of important opportunities for effective conservation investment. We are poised to celebrate the House's expected passage today of permanent funding, permanent reauthorization of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. This is a momentous achievement for the long-term preservation of our country's most pristine landscapes, and we thank those of the, on the subcommittee for their steadfast support for the America's best conservation program permanent. With LWCF's future secured, we must now look how to best fund it. <laughs> The Conservancy supports $600 million in discretionary appropriations for LWCF's fiscal year 2020. The Land and Water Conservation Fund has strong bipartisan support, and we look forward to working with this subcommittee and the authorizing subcommittees to find permanent funding solution for LWCF. We also strongly support funding for habitat and wildlife conservation programs like the Cooperative Endangered Species Fund and state and tribal wildlife grants. These and other investments are essential to ensuring strategic action to prevent species from being listed as threatened or endangered. Notably, the Conservancy requests continued investment to restore and conserve sage-grouse habitat and greater sage-grouse across federal, state, tribal, and private lands. We need these resources to implement on-the-ground projects and facilitate partnerships and science necessary to, for effective conservation. We hope that all our work together can avoid the need to list the sage grouse. We are also supporting funding practical, innovative climate solutions to create an energy future that is cleaner, more secure, and gives consumers greater energy choice. Investing in nature brings strong returns for our security, the economy, and our communities and our families. The Conservancy is focused on supporting programs and investment that ensure economic and environmental benefits are enhanced today and made sustainable for tomorrow. I'll close by thanking the subcommittee for its support of the fire funding fix in the omnibus appropriation bill last year. The pass passage of this much needed funding solution means that dollars appropriated by this subcommittee can be used for their intended purposes and not to be drained for, to fight catastrophic wildfires in the upcoming fire season. Our forest management funding request seeks to re reinvest savings resulting from a fire fix which would reduce future wild ri wildfire risk. By investing in strategies like the proactive hazardous fuels and restoration treatments, we can leave forests in a more natural condition resilient to wildfires. Again, thank you for the opportunity to submit the Conser Nature Conservancy's recommendations for fiscal year 2020 appropriations. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I believe we had President Drake from Ohio State uh, on that tour as well. Uh, yeah. It was a very We'd love to take any of you to any <coughs> lots of great areas around the world, around the country. And a bunch of OSU kids do. They oh, show nice. them the, the nice. projects as well. So Good. Thank you. I appreciate it. 
Mr. Dinsmore, you have five minutes. Wonderful, thank you. Madam Chair, Ranking Member Joyce, Honorable Members of the Subcommittee. My name is Jason Dinsmore. I'm the Executive Director of Minnesota Conservation Federation. I'm a resident of Rochester, Minnesota. I'm also a licensed attorney, small business owner, husband, father of two wonderful boys, hunter, angler, camper, enthusiastic enjoyer of the outdoors, and a public land owner. Minnesotan. <laughs> and a Minnesotan, yes. <laughs> Not by birth, but, but by choice. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony in support of the Land and Water Conservation Fund in the fiscal year 2020 Interior Appropriations Bill. Few things are more important to the nation's booming $412 billion outdoor recreation economy than publicly accessible land and water. Without an easy way to reach the woods, waters, and wildlife, the 49% of the U.S. population that participates in outdoor recreation would be left uncertain where or when they would be able to swim in a lake, fly a kite at a local park, chase grouse in a national forest, or pursue their preferred way of connecting to the outdoors. As a result, they simply will participate less. Our nation's public lands ensure the democracy of hunting, fishing, trapping, and outdoor recreation. Everyone who wants to has a place to do so. <coughs> Regardless of class, culture, socioeconomic status, or any other societal bucket you find yourself within, you have access to, and are truly an owner of, millions of acres of publicly accessible land. This vast network of lands and waters and the economy it supports depend on the state and federal programs like LWCF. Strong funding for LWCF is paramount to keeping our thriving outdoor recreation economy and our heritage alive. Conserving our natural resources while meeting the present day needs and challenges put upon them is a daunting task for us all. To succeed, all stakeholders, forestry, farming, private landowners, and public users must work together to take on this challenge, balancing population growth and development pressure to, uh, to keep pace with conservation needs and demands for access to the outdoors. The LWCF encourages voluntary conservation partnerships with private landowners to keep working lands working, forests growing, and ranching in production. LWCF helps meet the climate challenge and brings needed funding to rural areas. For every dollar spent or invested through LWCF, four dollars are returned to the local economy. The LWCF is essential to water, land, and wildlife. Whether in a national park, keeping our natural history alive, or having a wildlife refuge for natural reproduction of fish and wildlife, it has helped protect at-risk species including pollinators, as well as habitat for fish, wildlife, and fur bearers. In addition to the permanent reauthorization being voted on in the House this very day, I respectfully ask the committee to provide an increased funding for LWCF in the fiscal year 2020 Interior Appropriations Bill. It is imperative that Congress provide long-term funding security for the LWCF ensuring that the asset for asset promise made to the American people to reinvest their offshore energy revenues in land and water conservation is honored. Although LWCF is authorized for up to $900 million per year, it has rarely reached half of its potential funding level in the recent years, while remaining funds have been diverted elsewhere. I understand the financial constraints facing our nation today, but I also believe that we can't afford to lose the conservation opportunities that LWCF addresses and the activity interjects into local and state economies. I respectfully ask that you support an appropriation of $600 million a year uh, for LWCF in fiscal year 2020. At two-thirds of the program's authorized funding level, it represents a careful investment that spreads our limited resources wisely across urgent and diverse priorities. It also makes real progress toward the goal of fully funding this critical program. Last year, about $40 million of recently appropriated U.S. Forest Service LWCF land acquisition funds were borrowed to pay for wildfire costs. Fire borrowing is not a new concept, and in past years, the annual appropriations bill included a chunk of funds to repay swept accounts, including LWCF. We want to thank the House for including the funds and authority to repay U.S. Forest Service accounts, including LWCF, as part of the supplemental appropriations bill that was passed in the House in late January, and hope this subcommittee can work with the Senate counterparts to make sure a solution is worked out. Minnesota LWCF lands and, and, and uh, opportunities are counting on it. One such, project, one such project that is pending, LWCF funding is vital for the Superior National Forest to continue its multi-phased Minnesota School Trust Funds project, the Chairwoman is well aware of, which helps resolve the decades-old land management issue resulting from more than 80,000 acres of state school trust lands being embedded within Superior National Forest BWCA, Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Embraced by local governments, conservationists, school districts, and timber companies, the project is being implemented by the Conservation Fund through a unique solution that will secure more than 40,000 acres for sustainable timber harvesting and increased school trust revenue while protecting 50,000 acres within the BWCA for enhanced hiking, canoeing, camping, and fishing opportunities. 
Madam Chair, honorable members of the subcommittee, I re reiterate our support for the, su for the Land and Water Conservation Fund and Fiscal Year 2020 Interior Appropriations Bill. And thank you for your time and attention to the support in either. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your testimony. And uh, lastly, Mr. Ring, you have five minutes to address this committee. Thank you. Representative McCollum, Representative Joyce, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today on behalf of the Coalition to Protect America's National Parks um, and to share our views on the FY 2020 budget for the National Park Service. I've served on the Executive Council of the Coalition for the past five years. I retired from the National Park Service in 2004 after 35 years of, of uh, federal experience, 33 with the National Park Service, uh, where I worked as, for 20 years as a park superintendent and for four years as an associate director of the service. The coalition has more than 1,600 members with more than 35,000 years of experience in managing and protecting national parks. As you know, national parks host hundreds of millions of visitors annually who come to enjoy the spectacular natural, scenic, and cultural resources that the parks preserve. The National Park Service also touches the lives of even more of our citizens through a, a number of partnership grants and, and technical assistance programs. This work would not be possible without regular annual appropriations from Congress to support over 23,000 employees and 400,000 volunteers who are dedicated to preservation and, and guiding the enjoyment of these special places. The coalition is relieved that the 2019 budget for the National Park Service was finally enacted after the long federal government shutdown. We're particularly pleased to see that Congress rejected the large budget cuts presented by the administration and instead produced a bipartisan Department of Interior Appropriations Act as part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act, which provided $3.22 billion for the National Park Service. It is somewhat unusual to be appearing before the subcommittee to discuss the upcoming FY2020 National Park Service budget without having a proposed budget from the administration uh, to review. Thus, our request will be based on the recently enacted Appropriations Bill of FY2019. We continue to hear so much discussion about the maintenance backlog of the National Park Service that we worry that the deferred maintenance backlog may be the only issue facing the NPS that gets it it's getting attention from members of Congress and the public. Parks still suffer from significant reductions in staffing over the past decade due to decreased annual appropriations over that period of time. To put this in perspective, appropriations for the National Park Service were $3.275 billion in FY 2009, a full 10 years ago. That's just $53 million more than was just appropriated in FY 2019. Over that time, inflation increased by 17.3 percent. Uh, the NPS would need essentially $3.84 billion in appropriations this year just to stay even with inflation. In addition, the uh, appropriations have also been spread thinner as Congress continues to increase the responsibilities given to the National Park Service through the addition of new parks and programs. Over the past 10 years, NPS has, direct, has been directed to manage 27 new parks, five more national trails, five new wild and scenic rivers, and to coordinate assistance for three new affiliated areas and nine national heritage areas, along with eight grant programs. Park visitation remains very high, with 331 million people visiting the parks in 2016, with having an estimated impact of $18.2 billion in, in direct bene economic benefit to local gateway communities, and, and almost double that um, in, uh, when you add indirect economic impacts uh, as well. Effectively managing uh, the demands that the Park Service is placed with uh, is proving more and more challenging with funding that is not kept up with the Park Service's costs. Thus, the coalition requests that, um, that the committee consider increasing the Park Service's budget by at least $565 million um, to bring the FY 2020 NPS back towards the, the levels of service the agency had in, in 2009. Okay. Um, I have several other uh, points, but I see I've run my time and, and uh, be happy to continue to work with the committee and answer, answer any questions you may have. Thank you. <clears throat> we appreciate your sticking to the time limits. There's obviously many people waiting behind you. 
<clears throat> Madam Chair, do you have any questions? Um, <coughs> one of the comments that, that was in some of the testimony that um, I think goes to the reason why we need to preserve the test and, and enhance is uh, is uh, when it comes to forest properties, it was like they compete to be second homes. And we certainly saw a lot of that happen in northern Minnesota when I was in the State House around Lake Vermilion, and therefore we came up to make sure there was public access on Lake Vermilion. Um, and I, I watched that in the metropolitan area just growing up in the, uh, where farmland became primary homes. So um, the work that you do um, uh, as Conservancy is, is really important, and I just wanted to just, just highlight that. I, and the other thing is when you, I'm glad you talked about the park backlog and the maintenance backlog and everything that's going on. You know, I just like to remind people that the Arlington Memorial Bridge is part of the national park system that's being repaired. Yeah. And um, there's, there was a lot of uh, give and take back and forth between two states, the District of Columbia, not two states, one state and the District of Columbia about uh, how that was going to happen. That, that was a real, that was a real um, thoughtful move that the Department of Transportation had by making that bridge mm -hmm. um, part of the national park system. So we have bridges like that all across the country. Yeah. And so I think we ought to get to be real good friends with the folks over in, uh, in transportation appropriations and see what we can, if we can work out a bridge swap so we have some mm -hmm. more money for mm -hmm. our national park land. Uh, with that, um, Mr. Joyce, I'll let you uh, go to the other committee members. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Amity, any questions? Yeah, I had some until that intimidating comments from the chair. I mean, <laughs> let me gather my wits about me for a minute. I don't think I had anything to do with that, but I feel guilty for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know right now. I can't tell you. Um, I appreciate hearing the comments, um, and especially from uh, um, uh, the Nature Conservancy. And, and you mentioned my bird with the face only a mother could love, the sage hen, as I call it in Nevada, although I know members of this committee have said, well, how do they reproduce if they're all hens, but that's for a different meeting. So uh, l let me just tell you this. Um, I am very open-minded to the funding requests that you folks have all proposed. But kind of being experienced with bridges, here's, here's an experience with this committee. A couple of cycles ago, giving Interior $65 million for, for sage hen habitat, you know, I, I mean, it all started out as habitat loss and fragmentation. And the federal government hadn't asked for anything. And they were going to look for other people, which is fine, but they hadn't asked Congress. Congress gave them $65 million. We followed it up a year later, and 35 million of it, according to the Bureau of Land Management, stayed inside the Beltway. And it's a frustrating thing to talk about habitat loss and restoration. And by the way, that was preceded by fiscal years where there was 10 figures worth of study money getting to the point where there were solutions. So it's not like, hey, we didn't really know what the problem was there. Um, it, it's like, well, you never stop learning. but to have the majority of the money stay inside the beltway when you're talking about habitat loss and fragmentation was phenomenally frustrating, at least to me. So as we talk about whether it's parks, whether it's wilderness, whether it's endangered species, I mean, I'm kind of thinking one of the things we need to look at is we got to start building some fences around that money. And, and I'm not talking about defense money. I'm talking about resource money. Um, so I would just add that for when the time comes to say, well, if we really want to do something for parks or we really want to do, you know, for the maintenance backlog or whatever it's for, th that probably as a, as a function of our experiences, we ought to take a look at what's been done with the money so far and where we are down the road with respect to the resource. And so uh, if I can, I'd like to follow up with you and say, where do you think we're at on this? Because in a state that burned 10 million acres over the last 20 years, it's like, you know, that restoration stuff's kind of important, as important in sagebrush country as it is in forest country. So we'll look forward to working together. I yield back, Mr. Uh, ranking Member. Uh, thank you for yet another lesson. 
down. <laughs> Ms. Pingree. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for your work and your testimony today. Obviously, in the state of Maine, we care mm -hmm. deeply about our uh, relationship with the Nature Conservancy and conservation organizations, and we love our parks. So thank you for your work in the Park Service. Thank you. Uh, any questions at this time? Or, uh, I'll, I'll keep it very brief. Um, first, I just want to uh, thank the Nature Conservancy for its partnership in Washington State. Uh, we're very grateful for, for that. Um, and then, Mr. Ring, I just want to um, appreciate the point that you made as we try to address the maintenance backlog as later today the House takes up a bill that um, broadens more, uh, more parks and heritage areas, ensuring that there's um, funding for staffing and um, programmatic support for the National Park Service, I think is really important. Appreciate you making that point. Great, thank you all for being here today and appreciate your testimony. Welcome, I have the pleasure of introducing the next panel. I know we're just trying to confuse you all today which direction to look at. Um, and uh, we'll very pleased to start with Randy Petzl. Petzl, there you go, from the uh, Refuge Friends Incorporated. Thank you very much for being here today. Uh, Chairwoman McCullough, um, Ranking Member Joyce and members of the committee, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I'm Randy Petzl president of the Refuge Friends Incorporated, which is the Friends organization that's affiliated with the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge. In the midst of four million people down the road from the largest shopping mall in America and neighboring a major international airport sits a critical piece of Minnesota wilderness. The Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge was created in 1976 to provide habitat for a large number of migratory waterfall, fish, and other wildlife species threatened by industrial and commercial development, and to provide environmental education, wildlife recreational opportunities, and interpretive programming for Twin Cities residents. Considered one of the premier urban refuges in the national wildlife system, the 14,000 acre refuge is part of a corridor of land and water that stretches for 70 miles along the Minnesota River. St. Paul, Minneapolis, and the surrounding suburbs represent a rich diversity of cultures with a rapidly growing population of color expected to make up at least 40% of the population in 2040. Yet refuge visitation does not reflect this diversity. Unless urban refuges like Minnesota Valley welcome communities of color and identify barriers to participation, the future of conservation is at risk. Personal connection and experience with nature is the foundation from which a conservation ethic is built for future generations. Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge also provides a superior edu environmental educational environment in the Twin Cities. Through partnerships and training programs, the refuge served over 9,000 students and teachers in fiscal year 2018. Refuge staff provided expert outdoor lessons for students, trained dozens of new teachers in the skills of teaching students outdoors, and mentored recent college graduates to become the next generation of environmental educators. The resource needs of the refuge system at large are largely reflected locally at Minnesota Valley, and I'd like to highlight a few examples. Law enforcement. The refuge has only one wildlife officer, and he shared with a neighboring refuge 
covering much of the state of Minnesota. In addition, this one officer has been detailed to the southern border for six weeks in the last six months. During these times, the natural resources of the refuge and the safety of our visitors are compromised. Previously, the refuge had enough resources to fund three officers, and the demands of the urban population are only growing. Operation and maintenance funds. Minnesota Valley, like all refuges in the system, is poorly underfunded. It's actually estimated that nationally we are receiving only 50% of the needed operation and maintenance money. The Visitor Center in Bloomington is an aging resource. It's extremely valuable to our community. Important updates including new doors, upgraded security cameras, solar lights, the parking lot, repairs to our wheelchair lift and elevators are all outside of our present maintenance budget. Finally, urban program. We are connecting with a multitude of cultural and civic groups to engage with new audiences. Partnerships with local artists, art education, nonprofits, and cultural organizations connect nature, art, and employee focused on urban outreach. If the vision of providing urban refuges is reinstated, this is a program that began in 2012 with 14 refuges mentioned, only four have been funded so far. And we're hopeful that Minnesota Valley may be the next in line for that extra funding. <clears throat> Finally, this country's 567 wildlife refuges are a national treasure. They provide clean air and water, a haven for wildlife, and a place for people to connect with nature. At, the at this time, when America's children are suffering from too few outdoor opportunities, the work at the Minnesota Valley National Wide Wildlife Refuge and refuges around the country is especially important. I urge you to provide adequate maintenance and operation funding, law enforcement funding, and urban funding so that these refuges throughout our system can survive and thrive in the 21st century. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Micah from the uh, International Wildlife Refuge Alliance. Thank you, ma'am. Ma uh, Acting Chair Pingree, <laughs> uh, Chairwoman <laughs> McCollum, and Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on Public Witness Day. My name is Richard Micah. I'm chairman of the International Wildlife Refuge Alliance which is a nonprofit friends organization for the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge, which is the only international wildlife refuge in the country. We support the mission of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge uh, ha is carved out of critical pieces of habitat along the lower Detroit River and the western shore of Lake Erie. There are nearly 6,200 acres of critically important habitat now preserved or waiting to be restored within the refuge boundary. Lands owned or cooperatively managed with the Nature Conservancy and the Lake Erie Metro Park and extending from the Ohio-Michigan line north to Detroit along I-75. This bolsters roughly 8,000 additional acres of natural holdings of the Michigan Department of Natural Resources as well as 5,000 acres of conservation lands coordinated with Canadian partners and Ducks Unlimited. Our flagship, the Refuge's Humbug Marsh, is a Ramsar wetland of international importance and is ranked as globally impaired habitat. There is a transformation occurring in Detroit that is a model for urban wildlife corridors across the nation. Detroit was ground zero in the Industrial Revolution. We helped build the nation and then created infrastructure which helped win World War II. But then times got bad. Our people and the environment suffered. Everyone realized we couldn't continue, our pre we couldn't continue to pollute our precious waters in the, in the past. Our coastlines are worth more than we realized. The Clean Water Act, sponsored by our very own congressman, the late John Dingle Jr., provided the impetus to preserve natural areas in the coastal zone in the waters of the United States. Detroit is rapidly becoming a mecca for urban wildlife and environmental justice, a sustainable, healthy community for all. With additional investments, we will go even further. 
Remediation projects under the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative continue to clean up areas of concern, such as the Detroit River. Riverine bottomlands are being reclaimed, especially in the Conservation Crescent on the south end of Gross Hill, which borders the St. Lawrence Seaway. Since 2010, the federal government, you folks, have spent over $2.5 billion cleaning up the Great Lakes. Now, it behooves us to transform these resources into useful urban amenities, many of which can sustain migratory waterfowl. An additional investment of $400,000 in coastal wetlands and habitat, along with $350,000 for programmatic support and $250,000 to provide the much needed assistance in opening the refuge gateway with a world-class fishing pier and a visitor center, all in an effort to offer additional public access and quality recreational experiences that are the hallmark of the National Wildlife Refuge System and the National Wildlife Refuge Association. Today, 80% of all U.S. citizens live in an urban area. <clears throat> Many residents are disconnected from the natural world and the metropolitan the Detroit area is no exception. That is why it is so exciting to see the growth and development of the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge and how it is making natural experience as part of every A lifetime of adventure. Ever since I was old enough to be outside alone, I have cared about the environment around us. The great outdoors has a way of mesmerizing you. Once exposed to it, there's no turning back. Being alone in nature is very special. It's just you, the wind, the water, the waves. Then, all of a sudden, you realize that you're not alone. There are other life forms all around you in a vast, <clears throat> vast expanse of openness. What an awe-inspiring feeling. I only hope that what I'm doing here today will enable others to share in this experience. My presentation is a tribute to the late, great John D. Dingle, Jr., who loved the great outdoors. There I am. <laughs> Dead on. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, he was a wonderful guy. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. I saw him yesterday. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Hi. Good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Caroline Brower, and I am the Director of Government Affairs for the National Wildlife Refuge Association. I, am, I appreciate the invitation to testify today on behalf of the Refuge Association and our members and supporters, particularly the Friends Groups, who do such amazing work on the ground. In addition to Randy and Richard, who have testified today, Kimmy Fitzhugh is here as well. She's representing the Friends of Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge, who are our 2019 Friends Group of the Year. The Refuge Association was started 43 years ago by retired refuge staff who wanted to start a group to advocate on behalf of the National Wildlife Refuge System. Today, the refuge system consists of 100 million acres of land across 562 units in all 50 states and with an additional 750 million acres in five marine monuments in the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. If the refuge system were a country, it would be the size of India. We thank you for your support for funding of the refuge system. Operations and maintenance funding has increased incrementally over the last nine years, down from a high in 2010 of $503 million and a particularly low point in our funding history of $453 million in 2013. O&M funding is now sitting at $488 million, and I'm here to ask you for a major increase. The Refuge Association chairs <coughs> excuse me, a coalition of conservation, sporting, ocean, and advocacy groups called CARE, the Cooperative Alliance for Refuge Enhancement. This coalition consists of all of the major national groups who work on refuge issues, the Nature Conservancy, Ducks Unlimited, Safari Club International, Defenders of Wildlife, the Wilderness Society. There are 23 of us total, and we have been working together since 1995. The Refuge Association and CARE beat a steady drumbeat. The refuge system needs $900 million a year to even be competitive. The reality is, is that the refuge system is at a breaking point, financially. Morale is low, especially after this government shutdown. 
Individual refuges have lost perhaps half of their staff, and many, many refuges have closed and are unstaffed or have a staffer from their complex swinging by every week or so just to check on the property. At this point, I suspect that almost uh, that no refuges are fully staffed and a rare minority are even close to having a decent level of staffing. Everything in the refuge system is underfunded. For example, and Randy talked about this a little bit as well, law enforcement levels are sitting at 130 to 150 field officers total, and that's for 567 refuge units and 850 million acres of land and water. Even just considering the land acres, this means that on average, each federal wildlife officer is responsible for three quarters of a million acres. Five states and four <coughs> territories have no federal wildlife officer on the ground, including New York and your home state of Ohio. Nine states have only one federal wildlife officer, including Idaho and uh, Ms. Lawrence, who's a member of the subcommittee, her home state of Michigan. We all know that Detroit to the UP is not really the greatest commute. There are a total of around 255 full-time equivalent refuge law enforcement staff across the country. A study that was completed several years ago by the chiefs of police stated that the refuge system needs 1,149 full-time federal wildlife officers. This means that refuge law enforcement is working at 22% of their needed staffing levels, and this is unsustainable. Wildlife refuges in the National Wildlife Refuge System average almost $5 in economic return for every $1 appropriated. By far, the biggest challenge facing the refuge system today is the completely inadequate budgets that fail to cover the cost of maintaining this incredibly rich and diverse wildlife habitats that make up the system. The funding gap that has arisen due to low budget allocations over the last decade has degraded critical wildlife habitat and imperiled important species. We must change this trajectory. We ask that you make $900 million in funding refuge, refuge system O&M your goal. In meeting that goal, we're requesting O&M funding for 2020 of $586 million. Yes, that's a request of $98 million over current 2019 levels. It's a very big ask, but it's also absolutely essential. So what do you get for your extra $98 million? We will allow the refuge system to ramp up the number of federal wildlife officers, increasing their safety and efficiency. You will get a build out of the urban program that is bringing kids in urban areas out to wildlife refuges, either within their city limits or close to it. You will get more environmental education programs, connecting classrooms to the outdoors. You will allow staff to do basic infrastructure maintenance, maintain wildlife habitat with prescribed burns, and to focus on biology, the bread and butter of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. If you help us meet this goal, we all win. The wildlife that depend on these lands, bird watchers, hunters, anglers, kids, local hotels and vendors, and folks who just like to go tromping through the woods. I don't make this ask lightly, and I appreciate your consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, thank you all very much for your testimony, and, and uh, thank you for talking to us about the importance of these uh, um, wildlife refuges. We care about them deeply in the state of Maine, and your um, your remarks about how underfunded they are are quite alarming. So I hope that the committee is able to be supportive. So, Mr. Joyce, uh, thank you. Uh, I was appreciate your, all of your testimony, but and I appreciate as I was doing research one time to give a talk about the Great Lakes and the assets of the Great Lakes. That how many people come just to fish? I was amazed how many people come to watch birds. <laughs> and then when we went to the right, and then when we went right, but then when we were going out to, uh, it started under my predecessor Steve La Tourette on the uh, Ashtabula River, and it was actually removed it from the area as a concern. And uh, out on the boat that day, and they're doing the rehab. They're also putting in the things to help to bring the birds back every year. So, uh, I, I am just a, you know a junior. Uh, was it ornithologists where you uh, put out bird seed in the winter? <laughs> uh, but but it, it's amazing that they, when you talk to the people up there, how it's drawing people from all over the world to come during d different times of the year to see the things on the Great Lakes. So I appreciate your uh, uh, input on that. And uh, there's no wildlife officer in Ohio because there's no wildlife in Ohio. We're very. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That cleared that up. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kilmer, did you have any questions or thoughts? Thank you, Mr. Amade. All right, well, I yield back to the chair, and if she has any questions, she can close it out. Um, I just have some direction uh, to staff. Um, we're looking at this in some other areas where the question is, we can't hire staff or we haven't hired staff. 
So I want to look especially in law enforcement where we are on that because uh, sometimes uh, we have noticed that there have been physician, uh, positions that have gone vacant and haven't even been posted to be filled. And that is a concern um, of, of mine uh, as a, as Mr. Pitzel was uh, pointing out, um, when the last one of the last times, it wasn't the last time, I go to the refuge quite a bit, <laughs> um, I was talking to our law enforcement officer and he just gave you an example of probably what happened in the last year, but the same thing happened the year before. Um, when um, the, the hurricanes came through Texas, our law enforcement officer was down there, you know, giving backup and support as well as, sh as should be, but then we're down to zero. So there's a difference between um, you know, lending somebody out um, over and over again uh, because they have families. This isn't necessarily what they had signed up for. So we need to figure out if, if which is coming first. We can't hire or we aren't hiring or maybe it becomes a combination of both. So I thank you all for your testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So the next, the next panel is in for a real treat. Um, we're going to let Mr. Uh, Amade from uh, Nevada introduce, uh, well, he'll, he'll People from the, the bold north and from and from wet areas. Do you do you want the gavel? Do we dare trust you with that? No, oh, Madam Chair, don't. Let's not get carried away. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I I fully agree. Uh, so um, let's walk before we run, if with your permission. Yeah. So our Mi next two panelists, please come up. Mr. Colton and Ms. Hoskins. Although I don't know if I I don't know if I want to introduce anybody that's affiliated in any way, shape, or form with Don Young, but I guess since you scheduled it, I'll. I'll, uh, I'll go with the, uh, w with the wisdom of the chair. I'm sure Mr. Young's listening to you. I I'm sure he is too, and <laughs> therefore, please send me get well soon cards at your convenience. Mr. Colton, Executive Director, uh, Alaska Wilderness Lead. The floor is yours for five minutes. Hi, thanks so much. My name is Adam Colton. Uh, uh, I am the executive director of Alaska Wilderness League, which is the only national organization devoted exclusively to Alaska wilderness conservation. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, um, Ranking Member Joyce, um, other members of the committee, I, we're here, unlike a lot of the other witnesses today, not to ask for a single penny. Uh, where we're concerned about something that is that the government is spending money on right now, and that is this mad rush to drill in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the largest and, and, and wildest place left in America, America's uh, most iconic national wildlife refuge. Uh, we, we remember how we got here. Um, in the, the Tax Act that was passed in 2017, there was a provision tucked in. It was the only offset in the entire tax act, uh, an offset of $1 billion uh, for a bill that cost $1.5 trillion. Uh, we, um, we recognize there's a difference of opinion about perhaps different perspectives about whether to allow drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, but we think that there ought to be agreement that what the administration is doing is a huge mistake and needs to be stopped. Um, the Tax Act, uh, the promises that were made, the law itself provided for four years for the administration to undertake a, a thoughtful, more careful process if you're going to do this. But the administration uh, is rushing to do this in half the time. So, uh, in fact, the director, the, the acting director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service testified before the Senate. Uh, that, that it would be a four to five year process. But again, there's a rush to do this uh, in a way that uh, isn't in keeping with the law or, or the promises that were made at the time. Moreover, um, e if, you, uh, if the goal is to generate revenue as an offset for the Tax Act, um, we're concerned the administration now seems unconcerned with any revenue generation whatsoever. Uh, for example, to get the one billion dollars that the, for the federal treasury the administration purports this would generate, you would have to have a lease sale with minimum bids of two thousand seven hundred fifty dollars per acre. Uh, normally, on the uh, north slope of Alaska, we're seeing uh, if there are minimum bids at all, they're they're in the twelve to fifteen dollar range. Uh, so there's no indication whatsoever from the administration that there is a desire to have minimum bids 
what we're seeing is a desire to create new facts on the ground. The senior center from Alaska has made clear of this. She's been publicly quoted as saying that uh, we have to do this quickly because if you can get the leases held, the mineral rights held, they're harder to challenge. Finally, in the context of the Tax Act, there was a commitment made to have adequate consultation with the indigenous peoples uh, that might be affected by oil and gas drilling. Uh, but the 7,000 to 8,000 Gwich'in Athabascan people that live in 15 villages in northeast Alaska and northwest Canada are not adequately being consulted with. And in fact, the administration is de denying the, the basic subsistence consultation under the National, Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act uh, to Arctic Village, one of the, and, and other uh, Gwich'in villages in Alaska. Um, and uh, we find this fairly alarming since 80% of the diet uh, of, of the, some of these Gwich'in villages comes from the porcupine caribou herd that calves on the coastal plain of the Arctic Refuge. It's one of the largest land migrations on the planet. Again, I know you're dealing with many different issues of, of requests for funding, um, and I know it's not an easy thing to, to halt something that the, the administration is doing in the context of a budget appropriations measure, but it's urgent that the, the committee consider this because this isn't in keeping with the law. It's not in keeping with the promises were made, and again, I think both sides of the aisle should agree that even if, if you're against drilling, there's concerns about the precedent this sets for other wildlife refuge, other protected landscapes. If you'd like to see it done, surely you'd like to see it done in a way that's more protective of the resources, the indigenous cultures, and not to have a mad rush to drill in a reckless fashion that won't generate the revenue that was promised. Uh, so we respectfully request that the committee consider precluding any funding for this mad rush to lease, drill, the wildest place left in America, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Fulton. On behalf of Oceana, Ms. Diane Hoskins, Diane, the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairwoman uh, McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Diane Hoskins, and I'm a campaign director with Oceana. Uh, we're the largest international advocacy organization dedicated solely to ocean conservation. I'm here to speak in opposition to opening new areas to offshore drilling and the draft five-year program for offshore oil and gas leasing that is currently under development right now by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management in the Department of Interior. As you know, the five-year program governs when and where BOEM can offer offshore drilling leases to the oil and gas industry. The current 2017 to 2022 uh, program, which was recently finalized, rightly protected the Atlantic, Pacific, Eastern Gulf of Mexico, and much of the Arctic from new offshore drilling. Under the President's direction, the administration is developing an unnecessary plan to undo those protections for coastal communities and ocean wildlife. The draft 2019 to 2024 program released early last year proposes to massively expand offshore drilling to areas currently off limits to drilling and leasing. The new program is not needed because the current five-year program already goes through 2022. With tight budgets, this is one area the committee could pull back resources. Communities up and down the east and west coast strongly oppose the expansion of offshore oil and gas uh, drilling and exploration. Exploration plans threaten the continued prosperity of coastal communities and the states whose economies are inextricably linked to a healthy ocean and clean, oil-free beaches. In response to plans to expand drilling, Republicans and Democrats along the East and West Coast are united uh, against the plan to expand drilling. As of today, uh, opposition and concern has been expressed by every single East and West Coast governor. More than 330 municipalities, over 2,100 local uh, elected officials from local, state, and federal levels from both parties, more than 46,000 businesses that depend on clean beaches and a healthy ocean, the Department of Defense, Air Force, NASA, the Florida Defense Task Force, as well as fishery, uh, regional fishery management councils um, from New England, South Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic, and the Pacific, alongside numerous other commercial and recreational fishing interests. Offshore drilling and exploration proposals uh, pose a direct threat to tourism, recreation, and the fishing industries that depend on a healthy ocean. 
Along the Atlantic, Pacific, and C Gulf Coast of Florida, healthy oceans support over 2.6 million American jobs and roughly 180 billion in GDP, making them major drivers of coastal economies. We know that if fisheries are protected and properly managed, these jobs can be sustained for generations to come. This is in direct contrast to the limited supply of undiscovered economically recoverable oil and gas in the areas proposed for expansion. Oil and gas are finite resources. So when the oil runs out, so do the jobs. We also know that when they drill, they spill. The BP Deepwater Horizon blowout highlights how a single accident can lead to the loss of human life, devastate marine ecosystems, and cause tens of billions of dollars in economic damage. The disaster killed 11 rig workers, spilled more than 200 million gallons of oil, fouled thousands of miles of coastline, endangered public health, and killed thousands of birds, dolphins, and fish. In another example of misguided priorities, just yesterday it was reported that Interior's Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, Bessie, has been handing out hundreds of offshore drilling safety waivers to the very requirements that were put in place as a response to the failures leading up to the BP Deepwater Horizon blowout disaster. There are far too few safety measures currently in place, and Interior's resources should, should be spent on implementing current safety measures on the books, rather than circumventing the rules that were established through a rigorous public process. Expanded offshore drilling will never produce enough uh, oil to offset the risk of its devastating consequences. As the committee considers their priorities for FY20, um, Interior Environment Appropriations Act, we encourage the members to ensure that the limited resources for BOEM and Bessie are not wasted on attempts to expand offshore drilling to new areas and toss aside the far too few safety measures that are designed to protect workers and our environment. The current drilling plan already goes through 2022 and the new plan is not wanted or necessary. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Madam Chair, questions? Um, I just want to, for the record, make sure, because I looked at your written testimony, <coughs> Mr. Colton, make sure that, because you said it a little differently, so I'm quoting from your uh, written testimony, so in the tax cuts provision that you were talking about, where they used the opening of ANWR to balance the tax cuts. Uh, the agency would have to, and I'm quoting, the agency would have to set minimum bids of $2,750 per acre. This is more than 100 times the average lease bid on Alaska's North Slope. And then you go on to say, with no promises from BLM that they will set a minimum bid for lease. So th they put it, th they, they, they came up with a calculation, but mm -hmm. they didn't set, the, the, yeah. the law doesn't have a minimum bid in it, is that correct? There's nothing about a minimum bid in the law, and I, you're right, I didn't state it as artfully as I might have. Um, BLM isn't typically having minimum bids in, in the North Slope. It's just that they, they were seeing um, average um, bid amounts um, generating, you know, five twenty-five dollars an, an acre, but we're not, we're not seeing the agency set. They have the authority, the agency has the authority to set minimum bids. Uh, so if the, if the goal, there, there's been no indication in the process that there's a desire, interest to have any minimum bids whatsoever in this process right And now. then, sir, you, um, uh, uh, Mr. Edward uh, Shepard, the president of Public Lands Foundation, uh, in his written testimony, and he, he shorthanded it when he spoke to us, on page three of his testimony, he goes on to say about the EIS and ANWR, Quote, there's sufficient time to complete an appropriate level of review and analysis of the 1002 area overall impacts to ANWR and the Arctic Coastal Plains as a deadline for uh, conducting lease sales is more than five years away. It goes on to say, funding provided in the 2020 should be limited to gathering additional resources and wildlife information to support further review and analysis of oil and gas leaking impacts. You um, said in your testimony, if I, if I heard you correctly, and that's why I want to uh, uh, have this opportunity to ask you, that, you, that, that they're rushing through this. Um, they obviously have the amount of time, and I'm hearing that now I've heard this from two different testimonies. Could you tell me why you feel that they are rushing through this when they have this, this timeline um, that, you know, should be more than adequate for them to do what they need to do. Well, well, can you give us some examples, please? 
Well, the, the, they, the, again, the administration testified that they, before the Tax Act passed, that this would be a four to five year process. The law says that it would be, that within two, uh, 10 years, there would be two lease sales, the first of which need to happen within four years, but they're trying to do the first lease sale within two years. Uh, the Senior Center from Alaska has spoken publicly to the effect that it's important to have the lease sale as quickly as possible to create new facts on the ground, I'm paraphrasing, but more or less before there's a potential shift in politics that would make it more difficult to execute on this. This is widely unpopular what's being done. Two-thirds of Americans oppose it. The majority of Republicans oppose drilling the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge according to a Yale survey recently. So. That the reason, uh, wh wh why is it being rushed? Why is it uh, cut corners? We've never seen in the history of the National Environmental Policy Act a, a an environmental review that's happening this quickly for this complex and important an area. There's nothing in precedent uh, th to do it. This is the most important onshore denning habitat for polar bears in the United States, largest international migratory caribou herd, subject to international treaties, home to 200 species. You know, I could go on and on about the values that are at stake. This should be a much longer, more deliberate process. There's no new science that's being done. Uh, there are the EIS, the draft EIS that's been produced is riddled with mistakes, riddled with errors. I think, uh, okay. Yeah. I, 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 I would just think if you were doing something as controversial as this, you'd want to make sure you created the least amount of controversy building up into it. So I, I thank you, and that gives me some things to um, look into later with that. Mr. Amadei, I'll let you call in other members. Mr. Ranking Member, questions? No. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for being brief. Madam Vice Chair. I'll be very brief, but thank you for your testimony about Alaska and raising that alarm. And appreciate your work on the oceans. I think I may be the only person represented in the room who represents a district on the ocean. And um, I'm very pleased that our entire congressional delegation of all parties, Republican, Democrat, and Independent, have opposed offshore drilling and are very determined to make sure that it doesn't move forward in our state. So thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'll yield back to you for the next panel. You did a great job. <laughs> thank you very much for, for letting um, me play. Thank you so day. much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we have uh, the next panel coming up, um, Robin Kemper, uh, Charlie Whiplanger, uh, Lisa Bionito, not Bonito. I'm not saying it right, Lisa. Lisa can... Help me here. Leah Biondo. Leah. Oh. Society for Range Management. That Mr. Amade is waiting to hear. <laughs> um, there could be votes going off in the next uh, few minutes. So we'll let you get your testimony um, moving forward. Um, Ms. Ms. Kemper from the American Society of Civil Engineers. Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you so much for having me here uh, and be able to talk to you about the long-term strategic investment of our nation's infrastructure. My name is Robin A. Kemper, and I'm a licensed professional engineer and the 2019 president of the American Society of Civil Engineers, a professional engineering society with over 150,000 members. Many of you are familiar with ASC's infrastructure report card uh, that we release every four years, which evaluates and reports on the condition and performance of American infrastructure in the familiar form of a school report card. <coughs> infrastructure is the backbone of our economy. Yet ASC's 2017 report card had a grade of D+. Plus. And we determined that the investment gap of $2 trillion will be happening over the next 10 years. And our failure to act economic study found that the nation's deteriorating infrastructure and growing investment deficits hurts our nation's economy. Failing to invest by 2025 carries enormous economic costs to the tune of $4 trillion in lost GDP and 2.5 million lost jobs in just 2025 alone. And it's also costing every family $3,400 a year in disposable income. 
Our major infrastructure category in need of robust funding is our nation's drinking water and wastewater systems, which have an investment gap of $105 billion by 2025. Fortunately, there are funding and financing mechanisms, if fully appropriated, that could help close this gap. The Clean Water and Drinking Water State Revolving Funds each play a vital role in providing much needed investments in state and local wastewater and drinking water infrastructure. So our first ask of the subcommittee is to triple the amount of annual appropriations to the state revolving fund programs. We also request the subcommittee approve a million dollars to the EPA for its drinking water needs survey and assessment and its clean watersheds needs survey so that Congress, the EPA, and states have the necessary data needed to determine the water infrastructure needs of communities around the nation. Two other critical programs ASC supports are the Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation, or WIFIA, program and the Securing Required Funding for Water Infrastructure Now, or SRF, WIN Act. These programs are innovative financing tools that, when fully funded, have the potential to leverage limited federal resources and encourage greater private sector and participation in our nation's drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. So our second ask is to fund the WIFIA program at no less than the fiscal year 19's enacted level of $86 million and to fully fund the SRF WIN Act program at its full fiscal year 20 funding at $5 million. Another vital category in ASC's report card is public parks. Decades-long underinvestment has resulted in large backlogs of deferred maintenance, ultimately threatening the safety of these systems and the surrounding community's economic stability. In fact, the National Park Service has a $12 billion deferred maintenance backlog, including infrastructure projects related to eroding trails, visitor centers, roads, and water systems. So our third ask is to provide at least $2 billion to help address the National Park Service's growing deferred maintenance backlog. And finally, ASCE supports the U.S. Geological Survey's National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program and Stream Gauging Programs. The NEAR program is the source of 100 new technologies and standards that are used by design professionals such as myself every day to mitigate risks and save lives, protect property, and reduce adverse economic impacts. USGS's stream gauging program provides consistent, scientifically reliable data that's essential for flood risk assessments, water supply planning, and water quality appraisals. So our fourth ask is to fund the NERA and stream gauging programs, both critical risk mitigation tools at 75 million and 100.5 million, respectively. In closing, ASCE believes our nation must prioritize investments in our infrastructure systems. Strategic, robust, and sustained investments through long-term, reliable federal funding and through the use of alternative financing mechanisms can help close this infrastructure gap. Thank you for holding this very important hearing. And ASC looks forward to working with the subcommittee to find solutions to our infrastructure's investment needs. And I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Whiplinger, I noticed I hear that uh, you're a seaplane pilot, but you also served on Fleming Fields, which is South St. Paul's Airport Advisory Committee. So later on, you're going to have to tell me if you ever tried <laughs> to land anything on the Mississippi <laughs> River. Uh, uh, sir, sure the time is yours for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Glad I'm not the only engineer up here. We tend to be introverts and not very good at this public speaking thing. <laughs> Uh, so my name is uh, Chuck Whiplinger. Uh, I'm the president of a company up in Saint Paul, South St. Paul, Minnesota. We make floats for aircrafts that can land on water more than once. We also have a wild firefighting product called the Fire Boss. I'm here today to talk about my friends at the Recreational Aviation Foundation, the RAF, and to help tell their story. Uh, they were created 15 years ago. And to help tell their story, I've got five numbers that we're going to walk through today, and you can write them down and follow along if you like. 500 million, 400, 10,000, 4, and 2.5. So uh, to get right into it, 500 million acres. No dollar sign in front of this one. We're doing good. That's how many acres that the BLM and the Forest Service manage each year. On these four, 500 million acres are 400 plus landing strips. Uh, they're grass patches of, uh, uh, that serve as a landing strip less than a half mile length. Uh, they're very important to us and to uh, the public in general. 10,000 is the next number, and that's the number of REF volunteers 
uh, that help maintain these strips and partner with the land managers and the Forest Service and BLM. And these 10,000 folks rally behind four key uh, missions, access, safety, history, and service. These strips provide access to 600,000 pilots potentially, and if they bring passengers with them, that just multiplies upwards. We're all users of these public lands like everyone else. Uh, we love to go camping, hiking, all the normal things that everyone else does. They're in hard to reach locations without roads where it might be unfeasible to put a road in as well. Safety, if we're flying one of our airplanes over those 500 million acres, we have 400 sites to land on if something goes wrong. Also, those 400 sites that the general public that happens to be enjoying the, the land can be evacuated from should they need medical assistance, injury, other natural disasters. History, they're all very historical sites. Many of them uh, created after the turn of the 20th century to help fight wildfires with the Forest Service. And today they give us access to uh, historical sites like uh, Moose Creek, Idaho, which is where Gifford Pinchot created the first ranger station, and Missouri Break, Montana, where uh, is very close to the trail of Lewis and Clark. So, and the last thing is service. Uh, we're very fortunate to be able to fly into these areas. We recognize that and we want to give service to other people, uh, the handicapped, the elderly, our wounded warriors, and also people that need medical assistance and just support uh, in those parks. We have a story of one volunteer who landed one evening with his son and were quickly approached by rafters. Uh, this was on the uh, Selway River. And they uh, hauled a, a poor woman who was in her first trimester of pregnancy out to a hospital in Montana because uh, she was having pregnancy issues. Mm -hmm. She lost that child, but she had the necessary medical procedures done to be able to maintain two additional, uh, have two additional children, and is very thankful for these airstrips and the people that use them. Uh, so the last number, 2.5. Uh, we're asking that you continue to support the budget of to the tune of $750,000 that you have uh, set aside in the past to maintain these airfields. Uh, we can want to continue to partner with the Forest Service to maintain these airfields. Uh, and we're going to ask that you create a BLM budget, uh, Bureau of Land Management budget, to the same magnitude uh, so they can have a budget to work from to maintain these airfields, and we will gladly partner with them. That's about $2.50 per for each of the 600,000 pilots that uh, fly in our airspace today. Pilots get labeled a cheap bunch. I'm a one of them. Uh, but I don't think any one of us would complain too badly about $2.50 of our tax dollars to maintain these airstrips. Well, I can think of two guys. I'm willing to pay for one of them uh, today if I need to. And my friend John McKenney will probably cover the other guy, I'm sure. So uh, thank you. I look forward to your questions. And now we're going to hear from the Society of Range Management, Ms. Bonito. Good afternoon. Leah Biondo with the Society for Range Management. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. Uh, established in 1948, the Society for Range Management is the professional scientific society and conservation organization whose members are concerned with studying, conserving, managing, and sustaining the varied resources of rangelands, which comprise nearly half the land in the world. Specifically today, we'd like to address the ability of federal agencies to implement active land and resource management. Of the mere 26 position statements that SRM has adopted since its founding in 1948, two focus on the management of wild horses and burrows on rangelands. The society believes in the practice and enhancement of multiple use values of rangelands while maintaining basic soil, water, and vegetation resources. The Society supports wild horse and burrow use of rangelands in accordance with the Wild and Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act of 1971. The law specifies management to provide a thriving ecological balance. SRM interprets this to mean that long-term sustainability and productivity must be the primary consideration in devising legislation and policy for management planning and administration of rangelands, including establishment of proper numbers and management levels for wild horses and burrows. Rangeland health... Rangeland health standards and guidelines are equally appropriate for all herbivores. Wild horse and burrow populations increase rapidly, and their numbers commonly expand beyond herd management areas and exceed ecological carrying capacity unless excess animals are regularly removed. Adoption programs and sanctuaries for excess horses have only been partially successful. Overstocking results in deterioration of vegetation, soils, and watersheds, and leaves a potential for expansion of invasive species. Serious conflicts with wildlife, endangered species, domestic livestock, and other uses of rangelands have resulted. 
The federal government must implement more effective methods to manage and control populations of wild horses and burros. SRM supports changes in laws, policies, and administration to effectively and economically manage wild horse and burros to maintain healthy populations, reduce conflicts with other uses, and maintain long-term sustainability of range and resources. One such change would be to lift the amendment introduced by West Virginia Representative Nick Rahal in 2005 that states, appropriations shall not be made available for the destruction of healthy, unadopted wild horses and burros. SRM is also concerned with the lack of accountability in the use of taxpayer funds included in Division A, Title I, Section 109, which states, the Secretary of Interior may enter into multi-year cooperative agreements with nonprofit organizations and other entities for the long-term care and maintenance of excess wild free-roaming horses and burros. According to the BLM's 2018 report to Congress, the agency contracts with 30 private landowners primarily located in Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, and Oklahoma to handle the long-term ca care and maintenance of over 35 horses. Unfortunately, the U.S. taxpayer has no assurance that the private lands supporting these 35,000 horses are in a state of sound rangeland health condition and ecological status. We believe that the above section should be amended to include the sentiment that excess animals should be contracted to a private landowner or entity in an ecologically appropriate region with stocking rates and rangeland health conditions accredited by a certified professional in range management. This third party approval by a CPRM would certify that the private landowner is implementing sound management practices and is not degrading the productive soils of the Midwest by overstocking wild horses and burrows. SRM has continued to work with our community of professional societies to push for congressional support of federal employees participating in and being active in the continuing education programs provided by professional societies. Active participation must include travel to related conferences and workshops. On a related note, we just wrapped up our 2019 annual meeting in the Gateway to Prairie in St. Paul, Minnesota. We had over 1,000 attendees, 450 of which were students from tribal and land-grant universities competing in range and plant ID competitions. If Congress wants land management agencies to be best suited to deal with the high priority issues included but not limited to fire management and prevention, species and habitat improvement, along with implementing successful strategies that address climate variations, it is even more imperative that land management agency personnel have access to the latest research along with updates from the field and the training and techniques to implement practices. We are pleased with House report language and FY18 appropriations that confirm Congress's support of professional society related activities. We request that this congressional intent continues to be demonstrated with a greater emphasis placed on the importance of federal employee involvement in professional societies. In closing, we appreciate the opportunity today to provide testimony. Uh, members, our, our votes uh, have, a, have started. There's four votes, um, previous question and then a vote on a roll, previous question vote on a roll. Um, but I think if we could put on the, the floor without any volume, there won't be any volume because the vote's going on. Um, are there any questions? Mr. Joyce? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Whiplinger, on behalf of Congressman Mike Simpson of Idaho, who can barely walk right now or otherwise he'd be <laughs> here, <laughs> thank you for being here to testify on behalf of the Recreational Aviation Foundation. We appreciate the work you do to highlight the importance of maintaining backcountry back airstrips. The simple fact is that these airstrips save lives and for that reason are worth the small investment needed to maintain them. Thanks again for being here today. Thank you. I have no further questions. And I can testify to the fact that he was very ill when he got here this morning <laughs> from yes. his bad knee. He, he, sh he showed up, uh, but we were, were hope he's comfortable. Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your testimony. Um, thank you for um, always being up here and reminding us that we have to take care of what we have in order to build a brighter future for everybody to enjoy in the future. Um, it, um, I've been only on two of those airfields. I know I've, 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 I've seen more of them over my uh, opportunities to kind of be out in, um, in park and range areas and that. And, and, I, and I know how important they are not only to um, um, what you were saying for, for people who fly recreationally who enjoy them, but, but people do know you can get a pilot and you can, they, they figure out who to call and who has a plane and who can get in. So. I know your, your folks do a lot of great work. Thank you. And uh, we're trying to get the, uh, the range management right. And it's good to know that you're reaching out to um, 
the future too. So how many youth were out there? We had about 450 students, and they compete in range and plant and food competitions. Four, which, um, 450 students. 450 students, yep. Wow, and a mix of uh, tribal and non-tribal. Uh, Absolutely, youth. yep, yep. Also uh, from Canada and Mexico. Uh, we do have an international component too. Oh, that's great. Yep. That's great. Well, thank you all for your testimony. For those of you who are on the other two panels, we're going to excuse ourselves to, to vote because we wouldn't have an opportunity to hear um, everything all at once. We should be back quickly. Um, and uh, so for now, we're recessed until the call of the chair after votes. I know, I, I told you, I told you it was by the mark. You, you just didn't want to believe me. He doesn't want to see the refuge, he wants to see the Mall of America. At least he's honest. I'll get him out to band a duck, though. I was like, what is going to come on and just play me? <laughs> Full volume on the, like, you know.
Uh, welcome back. We are now going to hear from um, our panel. We have Michael Mays, Director of Animal Collections and Strategy, the San Diego um, Zoo Global, and Steve Homer, Vice President of Policy for American Bird Conservatory, American Bird Conservatory. So, um, Mr. Mays. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman McCollum and Ranking Member Joyce. We want to thank the subcommittee for the opportunity today to testify in support of the funding for endangered species recovery and the new Recovery Challenge Grant program as we enter into the 2020 appropriations process. My name is Michael Mason. I'm the director of San Diego Zoo Global as a director of collections and, stra and strategy. And I've been involved with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service recovery programs for decades. San Diego Zoo Global is a longtime leader in endangered species recovery around the world. Our Institute for Conservation Research houses one of the largest zoo-based multidisciplinary research teams with more than 150 researchers and staff who are leading experts in their field. We carry out carefully tailored species recovery plans and partner with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and with other dedicated partners. To date, we have bred more than 165 endangered species and more than 40 of those endangered species released back into the wild in our native habitats. One of our key recovery programs is the California condor, a coordinated public-private partnership that is saving a species once condemned to extinction. Partnering with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, state agencies, the Peregrine Fund, Oregon Zoo, Los Angeles Zoo, and Vantana Wildlife Society, and several other partners together, we provided critical genetic management and breeding and rearing and release to recover the condor. A total, once at only 22 condors in the world, today is now around 500. While significant progress has been made to save a species like condors from extinction, the fight to fully recover the species is not over. As a result of environmental degradation and threats from contaminants such as lead, condors in the wild are only sustainable with costly human intervention, including population management, tracking, medical testing, and treatment for lead exposure. Together, our nonprofit partners spend roughly $3.6 million annually in privately raised dollars to sustain this program. To assist in mitigating these costs, the Condor Partners, Association of Zoos and Aquariums, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, work with the appropriations staff and the fantastic subcommittee to establish the Recovery Challenge Grant Program in fiscal 2018. This new program was a landmark and recognized the critical, critically important role of nonprofit partners with the service for endangered species recovery efforts. Through a merit-based matching grants process, it provides funding in a more commensurate manner to support organizations implementing the highest priority recovery actions identified by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The Recovery Challenge Grant requires a substantial 50-50 match, a match in which we have gone above and beyond historically. The program also provides matching grants to many other longstanding priority partnerships outside of the Condor, such as the Northern Oplomato Falcon, the Whooping Crane, and Stellar's Eider. In fiscal year 2018, the Condor Partners were thankful to have received four grants from this program, in total of $1.5 million. This funding enabled us to provide the critical scientific expertise and on-ground experience essential to recover the Condor. Another example of a successful recovery partnership led by San Diego Zoo Global is our Hawaiian Endangered Bird Conservation Program. This is a three-way partnership operating in collaboration with Fish and Wildlife Service and the State of Hawaii Division of Forestry and Wildlife. Since its inception in 1993, more than 1,000 birds from 16 species have hatched, and approximately 800 of those from 10 species have been released into the wild. The most notable of those is the alala, or Hawaiian crow. Once extinct in the wild, today there are now 19 flying free. One major takeaway from San Diego Zoo Global's experience in recovery is that endangered species recovery is truly a shared responsibility. Our partners have made significant investments to keep efforts going. However, federal funding for Endangered Species Act programs has not kept pace with needs. The creation of the Recovery Challenge Grant Program has been an incredibly important step in that right direction. As the committee develops the fiscal year 2020 Interior Environment Appropriations Bill, we urge you to continue to provide robust funding for endangered species recovery and prioritize long-standing recovery efforts 
in which existing resources and partner expertise can be most effectively leveraged. Specifically, we request an increase to the Endangered Species Act recovery to $100 million and a request to increase the funding for the Recovery Challenge Grant to $8 million. This funding will enable us critically to recover partnerships to sustain, their to sustain our work so together with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we can realize the goal of full recovery of condors and many other critically endangered species. We do thank you sincerely for your support and effort in this process. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Uh, American Bird Conservancy respectfully asks the committee to increase U.S. Fish and Wildlife's uh, bird conservation programs. We are a mid-sized bird conservation group that uh, works to conserve birds in their habitats throughout the Americas. We have about 80 people on staff, including three foresters who work in the state of Minnesota, working to recover habitat for the golden wing warbler. Uh, we found that birds are a key indicator of environmental health and provide many benefits to our environment and the economy, including billions of dollars each year from wildlife watching. Unfortunately, the 2016 State of the Birds report produced by government and agency scientists found that one-third of all migratory bird species are in decline and in need of conservation action. With the support of Congress, we believe we have the tools needed to reverse these declines. Specifically, we, re we request an across-the-board funding increase for the Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act, Migratory Bird Joint Ventures, State and Tribal Wildlife Grants, and the North American Wetlands Conservation Act to promote the conservation of at-risk bird species. International reserves protecting migratory bird wintering grounds have been made possible by NNBCA grants. It's really one of the few sources of funding for overseas work. Um, the program has been funded at 3.5 million, 3.9 million in recent years, uh, but the lands package up today includes reauthorization at 6.5 million, and we believe that the program should be fully funded at 6.5 million. The Migratory Bird Joint Ventures, which are conservation committees in each region of the country, are now carrying out projects to provide habitat and boost population numbers of species of concern, such as the Cerulean Warbler. Both the Central Hardwoods and Appalachian Mountain Joint Ventures are conducting forest restoration projects to benefit these this species. We believe the Migratory Bird Joint Ventures, or JVs, have become a critical nexus capable of carrying out an expanded bird conservation program. Funding has been flat or declining over the past seven years, and the JV Management Board has identified 19.9 million as the necessary amount to carry out their mission, and we urge funding be increased to that level. Thanks to NACA and wetland conservation, waterfowl have been making an amazing comeback and are now thriving. We ask that NACA be increased to 50 million. And for state and tribal wildlife grants, we request 70 million. To address several further threats, one of which you just heard about, um, the risk of extinction to Hawaiian birds and preventing the spread of harmful invasive species. We urge that the Endangered Species Recovery State of the Birds activities be increased to $5 million from the current $3 million level and a $10 million increase for early detection and control of invasive species. These funding recommenda and <coughs> recommendations are endorsed by National Audubon Society, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and over 100 other bird conservation organizations. American Bird Conservancy also asked the committee to please oppose harmful policy riders that would erode the Endangered Species Act, including listing exemptions to the greater sage-grouse or other species. Other past riders to drop, including requiring EPA to treat air emissions from forest biomass as carbon neutral, prohibiting EPA from requiring Clean Water Act permits in certain circumstances, and prohibiting funding to regulate lead content of ammunition or fishing tackle. Solutions are also urgently needed to both address climate change and ensure the conservation of birds in their habitats. We've developed a Bird Smart Wind Energy Program and a new report that carefully details how we can build wind energy while avoiding and minimizing impacts to birds. Another key climate solution in, in you know, analyzing all the impacts to bird would be to further incentivize solar installations in the already developed landscape, such as rooftops, parking lots, and brownfields. This will further accelerate the growth of renewable energy, possibly create wealth in blighted areas, and also lower the risk of collisions and electrocutions to birds posed by the construction of new power lines. Uh, we estimate as many as 30 million birds a year die from collisions and electrocutions from power lines, so it is a significant threat that currently is not fully and adequately mitigated. Protection of existing carbon stores, such as the old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest and Tongass National Forest, is another key climate solution. The 20-year monitoring reports of the Northwest Forest Plan found that it is recovering old-growth forests and improving water quality, 
And another study confirms the plan has turned the Northwest forest from a carbon source to a carbon sink, an important climate change success story. Forests sequester about 11% of our annual carbon emissions, so it's essential we prevent forest loss and protect the mature and old growth forests that store the most carbon per acre. In addition, logging it is itself a major source of emissions that managers need to start fully accounting for and considering in management decisions. We recommend expanding programs that help keep forests as forests, such as Forest Legacy, as well as the successful Legacy Roads program to improve water quality. To address fire risks, we recommend providing direct grants to homeowners and businesses to protect and retrofit their structures and also to carry out defensible space work. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Joyce? Well, thank you for being here today. I appreciate what you do, but uh, and I apologize for being a little late but uh, on my return, but I don't have any questions this time. Thank you. Okay. Um, so one, one thing that I'd like to um, focus on, and I've used my state as an example of a pretty shocking graphic, and I wish I would have brought it down with me, um, is uh, what is going to happen with Minnesota's trees and forests and pines, and it's, it's going to look radically different. Um, we're already seeing some of the creep of prairie. We're seeing invasive species come in, um, put a, a lot of our... Um, our trees at, at great stress and, and great and great risk. Um, so one of the questions that um, I asked an earlier panel um, is um, what, I mean, with, with some of the research that, that's going on, you're trying to bring species back, um, but, you know, preventing the species from becoming stressed in, in, in the first place. Um, is there, if, and if you don't have an answer for me now, but if there's things that you can point to that we can talk to the Forest Service about for um, research for bird habitat, that would be um, greatly, greatly appreciated. If you have a comment now, that, that would be fine. Um, so when you, and then the other thing is you kept talking about invasive species being a stressor, and so I would, first thing that comes to mind is what's happening to the trees, and I don't know what you gentlemen might have met by invasive species as a stressor, if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, yeah, there's quite a lot that we could do working <coughs> with the Forest Service in terms of doing restoration on forests. And we're, um, our organization is engaged in active forest restoration, so we do see a legitimate role there. But we do also see that science needs to be an essential guidepost for that work. And so we're strong supporters of full NEPA analysis for forest management projects. Um, we do believe that there needs to be more investments in the forests. We still have a large road maintenance backlog, for example, on the national forest system. And in some regions, water quality, such as the Northwest, is still a major issue where there's a, a tremendous amount of watershed restoration work and job creation that could be happening to address those, those needs in those areas. Um, in regard to invasive species, I was thinking about some other critters like, uh, like feral pigs and snakes w oh, and, yeah. and, and, and the Everglades, which have now proven to be a huge hazard for birds. Uh, we do have programs that do um, monitoring and control, and it really is the initial attack. When we find that there's a problem, we need to get on it really fast, and so that's why we're asking for the $10 million increase for that part of the, the DOI program. Some of the one of the things that comes to, to mind is just how delicate these ecosystems are. And when you imbalance them, you have all these cascading events that occur that you described. Invasive species moving in, forests lost. Um, our, our Institute for Conservation Research, when we're doing a reintroduction program, sometimes it involves habitat restoration at a botanical level with, with plants, or it might be a, a species that's codependent on another, like, like the presence of ground squirrels and burrowing owls. So Doing that analysis early on to determine what those primary factors are is key. But also we realize that, that we are not living in an environment that's of its, of its normal anymore, mm -hmm. that it's a changing environment, and we're sharing space with all these amazing creatures and with all these wonderful plants. But that's why we have to make sure that we try to keep these ecosystems as normalized and balanced as it possibly can be done. So uh, with the international bird migration, we have partners with, with Canada and some of our, our, our partner um, our countries, uh, Central and, and, and Latin America, Mex Mex Mexico too, and that includes pollinators um, a, as partners. Um, our, 
you know, that, that's something that the international programs always look at, at being cut. And I think birds, people get birds. People know, I mean, we even have the term for people in Minnesota. We call them snowbirds when they go down south, right? <laughs> um, people get birds uh, going uh, out there. Um, our international partners, are they feeling some of the same stress because we just went through a global environmental, um, you know, uh, discussion about what to do about climate change, and then we had the global shock to our economies back, you know, uh, 10 years ago. Can you tell me how our partners are faring Cause I, I, and what you think our fair share should be in some of these international monitoring programs? Sure. Well, you know, in, in terms of bird conservation, things are going very well with our partners in Canada and south of the border. Uh, the NNBCA is, is the essential matching grant program um, that provides for projects in these areas. And so that, that, those projects and that, and that process has been working great. And, and just to put in another plug for the Migratory Bird Joint Ventures, they actually extend into Canada and in, down into Mexico. And it's really a, a habitat-based approach. So, for example, in the state of Minnesota, based on your geography, on the west side of the state, you have the Prairie Pro Pothole Joint Venture. Right. And on the east side, the Upper Miss River Great Lakes Joint Venture. And I think that, you know, getting back to your question on forests, we are going to have to keep a very close eye on the ecosystems. I, I've seen some studies that show that forests could actually help slow things down in terms of by maintaining moisture and stability on a part of the landscape. So I think that there is, you know, hope that things aren't going to just be immediately lost. Um, but uh, again, it's going to take a, a lot of careful monitoring, and we think that the, the joint ventures are actually a great vehicle to be looking at how habitats are faring. And, and many of these many of these species of birds are are critical in the, ma the maintenance of these landscapes. They're, they're seed dispersers, they're pollinators. Some plants won't even germinate without passing through the gastrointestinal tract of a bird. So this is where that, that cascade of events can go out of control when this ecosystem is imbalanced. And because we've got another panel behind you, but you've all waited, uh, you're gonna get a little extra attention then. Um, so when um, we're talking about um, identifying and, and the public, Birding's just taken off off the chart, and there's all bird birders come in all different shapes, sizes, and, and ranges. What are some of the things that um, when you when you're engaging with the public that that they're looking for that they're looking forward to seeing or are having happen um, in either our national uh, parks and our open spaces or in urban settings to um, be better birders? I have I have people come up and ask me ask me about this, believe it or not, in Minnesota, because I worked on a birding trail at one time. So are you, are you hearing feedback in your surveys? Well, we are, and it, it's kind of a quandary for us because we're trying to mobilize the birders, and yet we're finding that they like the backyard birds, the, you know, the, the, the things that they're going to see. So when we talk about some of these more far-flung species, they don't always connect to them. So we're, we're actually you know, trying to engage people a little bit more in terms of where they live and we do have a number of programs of dealing with urban areas. Collisions with windows, for example, is a, a major issue, and there is legislation in the Bird Safe Buildings Act that could help us address that issue. So um, we are trying to get people to realize that even you know, what's happening in their community, planting enough trees in urban areas is another good solution that can both improve energy efficiency for buildings but also provide habitat within our cities. And then my last question, I, uh, and it's very controversial dealing with uh, getting the lead out, um, so to speak, but uh, it, that seems to be a leading indicator for harming uh, condors from your testimony. Where are the condors getting the lead from? From sport hunting. So when hunters go out and do sport hunting, sometimes they leave part of the animal behind. Right. And condors, being a scavenging species, go down and consume the, what's left. And they incidentally take the lead in that way. Um, with regards to lead, if you just look at lead as a toxin in the environment, and it isn't just condors, it's anything that scavenge, that scavenges a, a carcass. But if you look at it in the context of just being a toxin, we've had lead in paint, and we found out that our children were chewing on their cribs and their toys, and we decided as a community to take it out of the product. We had it in gasoline, and we removed it because of its toxic properties. The same is true with lead ammunition. There is alternative ammunition that allows for sport hunting to continue at every level that it is now, yet it's an alternate that is non-toxic when consumed by other animals, and sometimes people. Sometimes people are taking lead in incidentally from sport hunting. Okay. Thank you both very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have anything after you sat here? Okay.
Thank you for your time. Yeah. I'll let you do the la introduce the last panel. <laughs> and thank you so very much for waiting. We really appreciate it. Sweet, are you? I think they might be waiting for you to call them up. <laughs> He'll let you know. You can sit. You can sit in any order you want. Well, David will Welcome. take good care of you. <laughs> Thank you all for being here, and uh, you know, sort of like the wedding feast at Canaan, we save the best for last, right? <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> we tend to have a, a follow this list here, and you'll all be given five minutes to uh, address the, what's left of our committee, but yeah. the most important person, obviously, the, chair, the chairwoman. Uh, but we'll start with Mrs. Zimian. Yes. All right. Thank you. You, you have your five minutes. Members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Jocelyn Zimian, and I'm Senior Legislative Specialist at the Humane Society Legislative Fund. I'm here to talk about the Fish and Wildlife Services International Wildlife Conservation Council, or IWCC. We request the subcommittee to block all funding for the IWCC in fiscal year 2020. The IWCC was created in 2017 per its charter to advise the federal government on increasing public awareness, quote, regarding the conservation, wildlife law enforcement, and economic benefits that result from United States citizens traveling to foreign nations to engage in hunting, unquote, and on, quote, the benefits international hunting has on foreign wildlife and habitat conservation, anti-poaching and illegal wildlife trafficking programs, and other ways in which international hunting benefits human populations in these areas. The IWCC was established under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA. This statute stipulates that advisory committees be established only when essential and their number kept to a minimum. Advisory committees also must be in the public interest in connection with the agency's mandate. Finally, the advisory committee's membership must be balanced in terms of the points of view represented and must not be inappropriately influenced by any special interest. The IWCC violates FACA's criteria in multiple ways. The council is not essential, not in the public interest, and is not balanced or protected from undue influence of special interests. As such, the IWCC is not a responsible use of American taxpayers' money. For starters, the IWCC is not essential. In 2013, the service created a wildlife trafficking advisory council to fight illicit wildlife trade and to improve enforcement of wildlife trade laws. The council played a key role in government response to the wildlife trafficking crisis. But in September 2017, the council was deemed inessential and was, discon was discontinued. However, just a few months later, the service created the IWCC to consider some of the very same topics. Another advisory committee called the Hunting and Shooting Sports Conservation, <coughs> Conservation Council addresses matters in the IWCC's purview, such as expanding access to hunting and shooting on public and private lands, and encouraging partnerships among sporting organizations, the public, and various government entities. The IWCC is also inessential in a broader statutory context. The Council's duties include recommending the removal of barriers to importing legally hunted wildlife and recommending ways to streamline or expedite import permits processing. Yet through the Endangered Species Act, parties can apply for import permits that aim to demonstrate trophy hunting's benefit and can comment on permit applications and foreign species listing petitions. So there's no need for an advisory council for these purposes. Second, federal advisory committees should serve the public interest by helping the federal government gather balanced information through an open public input process, but the IWCC doesn't comply with that either. In fact, the IWCC's very purpose is inconsistent with the public interest. 
the IWCC seeks to promote international trophy hunting and to relax restrictions for importing trophies of ESA listed species, presuming as incontrovertible fact that trophy hunting promotes wildlife life conservation. But this is a controversial, hotly debated subject with ample scientific evidence to the contrary. Yet the Council's own goals preclude objective investigation and airing of these ideas. On a more basic level, at the IWCC's first meeting, my organization witnessed the service giving this Council's members a presentation in the vein of Wildlife Conservation 101. If the Council needed this, le this lesson, they don't have the expertise to advise the government <coughs> on the world's most pressing conservation problems. The IWCC also violates FACA's requirement that advisory committees be objective and outside undue influence from special interests. Almost all of the Council's non-governmental members come from the hunting world, professional and celebrity hunters, the hunting tourism industry, and the firearms and ammunition lobby. These people have financial, personal, or other vested interests in reducing restrictions on international hunting. This makes them unfit to advise the government on conservation. In short, the IWCC fails to meet FACA's own criteria for advisory committees. Once again, this Humane Society Legislative Fund urges the subcommittee to block any funding for the International Wildlife Conservation Council. Oh, I'm sorry. Duh. <laughs> Thank you very much for your testimony. I was listening and I, I <laughs> tripped it off. I apologize. Uh, Ms. Wall, uh, you have five minutes to address us. Thank you, Chairwoman McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce. Thank you so much for the opportunity to offer testimony today. My name is Kate Wall. I am a Senior Legislative Manager with the International Fund for Animal Welfare, or IFA. IFA has 17 offices globally and works in more than 40 countries around the world. Recognizing the unbreakable link between animals and human well-being, we support and <coughs> empower communities to coexist with and value native wildlife and help those communities to develop tools to protect their wild heritage. It is more crucial than ever to prioritize environmental protection and conservation efforts. Wildlife and wild lands are in peril around the world. Climate change and habitat destruction, ecosystems, um, sorry, threaten wildlife ecosystems and the very fabric of this planet we call home. Trafficking in wildlife and wildlife parts and products remains the fourth most lucrative criminal enterprise in the world, and scientists warn that species are disappearing so fast that evolution cannot keep up. However, at IFA, we see reasons for hope. If we invest wisely now, we can stem the tide of extinction. And the good news is that many of the programs that are best able to address today's grim challenges fall within the jurisdiction of this subcommittee. In my written testimony, I highlighted several important initiatives, but in the interest of time, I will focus on just three of those here today. First, IFOS urges this subcommittee to consider the health of wildlife and the environment in all of its actions. No federally supported construction project, including disaster remediation projects, should be exempt from such fundamental laws as the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act. These reviews allow construction projects to move forward while ensuring full disclosure of outcomes, informed decision making, and risk mitigation. There has been a distressing trend to exempt projects from NEPA, ESA, and other environmental reviews. And we urge the subcommittee to reverse this trend by denying funding for any plan that waives NEPA or the ESA. Second, as Congress moves to address our aging infrastructure, we have an opportunity to invest in environmental safeguards and conservation innovations that will ensure American well-being and security and create jobs and prosperity for citizens of today and for many future generations. Natural areas on public lands provide numerous valuable ecosystem services to the American people, including clean, drinkable water, flood control, so soil stabilization, climate regulation, wildlife habitat, and recreational op opportunities. National forests contain more than seven times as many miles of roadway as the interstate highway system, some 7,000 bridges and over 1,700 dams. Efforts must be made to repair or in some cases remove infrastructure that poses a threat to ecosystems and the public interest. 
IFA urges this subcommittee to prioritize funding for infrastructure projects within your jurisdiction that rely on sustainable or natural materials to increase infrastructure <laughs> resiliency and longevity, reintroduce or preserve native flora, implement natural alternatives like wetlands, dune restoration, and natural vegetation buffers, and reduce wildlife conflicts using wildlife corridors and crossings. We also encourage fully funding implementation of the Endangered Species Act. In spite of years of relatively flat funding, our nation's most important conservation law remains effective and has been successful in protecting 99% of listed species. These species, both domestic and worldwide, are integral parts of our ecosystem. While they face ever-mounting pressures, funding for the ESA has not kept pace with the need. IFA urges the subcommittee to direct the CRS to provide a report on funding levels necessary for Fish and Wildlife Service to fully implement the ESA. In the meantime, we ask the subcommittee to increase funding for ESA programs at a rate commensurate with increases to defense spending in order to better reflect the increasing need of imperiled species. IFA also thanks this subcommittee for its efforts to fend off appropriation riders in past bills and asks that any riders aimed at undermining the ESA be excluded from the FY20 Act. Likewise, we request a significant increase in funding for the Ma Multinational Species Conservation Fund. I will not repeat here the praises and justifications for these funds that you will hear from others and that was in my written testimony. I will just say that now is the time to invest more fully in conserving the species they protect. A recent report warns that, unless we take action, climate change will render the Bengal tiger extinct from the Inglian, Indian and Bangladesh mangrove forests within the next 50 years. Action is needed now, and IFAR requests that $18 million be appropriated for the MSCF for FY20. In closing, thank you for the opportunity to share IFAR's priority requests and conservation efforts in the FY 2020 Interior and Environment Con uh, Appropriations Act. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Aylward? Aylward. Aylward? Yep. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm the Washington <laughs> Office Director for the Bronx Zoo-based Wildlife Conservation Society. Good to see you. Nice to see you. You have five minutes to address us. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you, Chairwoman McCollum and uh, Ranking Member Joyce and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify in support of funding for the FY20 Interior Appropes Bill. I'm going to focus on four key accounts. Um, the Multinational Species Conservation Fund at Fish and Wildlife Service, the International Affairs Office at Fish and Wildlife Service, the um, Office of Law Enforcement at Fish and Wildlife Service, the Cooperative Landscape Conservation Program at Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as the Forest Service International Programs. Um, just by way of background, WCS was founded with the help of Teddy Roosevelt back in 1895 with the mission of saving wildlife and wild places uh, worldwide. Today, uh, we manage the largest network of urban wildlife parks led by our flagship, the Bronx Zoo. And globally, our goal is to conserve the world's largest wild places, focusing on 16 priority regions that are home to about 50% of the world's biodiversity. We have offices in almost 60 countries and manage more than 200 million acres of protected areas around the world, employing more than 4,000 staff, including 200 PhDs and 100 veterinarians. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank um, Chairwoman McCollum for her leadership as a uh, co-chair on the International Conservation Caucus and welcome our newest <laughs> co-chair. Um, Mr. Joyce, um, and look forward to working with you more on issues with the International Conservation Caucus. And as, as such, you know more than uh, most members that U.S. investments in international conservation deliver more than just the species saved and the habitats protected. Um, these investments also increase capacity in other nations to respond to extreme weather, to droughts, wildfires, and to build governance um, in these developing nations. Um, that's why WCS and our partners have just launched the Natural Security Campaign, uh, naturalsecurity.us. Um, and the campaign is intended to demonstrate that investments in international conservation by the U.S. can help prevent global conflicts, reduce international crime, and guard against natural disasters. In fact, we have a briefing on Thursday uh, at noon in the House Foreign Affairs Committee room, 2200. If you're available, we'd love to have you stop by. Um, the multinational species funds, tigers, rhinos, African and Asian elephants, great apes, and marine turtles face constant danger from poaching, habitat loss, and other serious concerns. 
Uh, the multinational species funds have helped to, to sustain wildlife populations by p controlling poaching, reducing wildlife populations, um, uh, by controlling poaching, reducing human wildlife uh, conflicts, and protecting essential habitats. These programs consistently leverage two to four times as much matching funds from organizations like WCS, foreign governments, local NGOs, and foundations. Um, one Great Ape Award that WCS received in FY17 is supporting five-year project to secure cross-river gorilla populations in Nigeria and Cameroon. Um, WCS is protecting intact old-growth forests that are home to the remaining 300 gorillas um, and a number of forest-dependent communities by establishing an effective network of core protected areas and corridors linking habitats between the two countries despite the pressure from Chinese developers and the provincial government's interest in building what they're calling a super highway um, through this critical habitat. So WCS is grateful that the committee has appropriated $11.6 million for the programs in FY19, um, which was an increase of $500,000, um, the first we've seen in at least three years. And I urge at least $15 million in FY20 for these programs as the threats still remain very, um, very strong. Um, I'll also mention that the lands package um, is being considered on the House floor includes the Wild Act, which would reauthorize the multinational species funds and expand the uh, marine turtle conservation to freshwater turtles and tortoises. So an increase in funding would also help these um, freshwater turtles and, and tortoises to receive funding immediately. Um, the International Affairs Office at Fish and Wildlife Service um, is able to address funding that are not eligible, species that are not eligible under the multinational species funds like jaguars and leopards. And so we're, um, we're glad to see that the funding for uh, the International Affairs was level with FY18 funding in FY19, um, and we'd like to see an uh, increase to $18 million in FY20. Um, the Office of Law Enforcement at Fish and Wildlife Service, an essential core group of folks, both domestic law enforcement as well as international. Um, they're often um, on the front lines of implementing the strategy to combat wildlife trafficking, um, both domestically and internationally. There's 11 attaches placed in U.S. missions and embassies overseas, um, and so this funding is essential to keep those coordinated efforts going. Um, we'd like to see an increase in funding in FY20 to uh, 85 million, and that increase could also cover two additional um, Fish and Wildlife Service law enforcement attaches in key um, transit points in trafficking. Um, the Forest Service program um, addresses illegal logging um, and approximately, uh, which causes about a billion dollar loss to the U.S. timber industry every every year, um, and about 200,000 jobs, um, which is res uh, responsible for about 15 to 30 of all timber by volume. Um, We'd like to see an increase in, of at least 10 million to the force. Uh, is that over? I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought it was counting down. <laughs> I, I apologize. I didn't give him the, the, the gavel. I'm sorry. I was <laughs> My apologies. I was going to throw it across at him. Amity and I can't be trusted with the gavel. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I appreciate it. And we went last, so you know, being a couple seconds over. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I you figured we're wrapping it up. <laughs> oh, so go ahead. Well, if you had a brilliant yeah. close, I don't. You know, give us it's the last the paragraph. Testimony. <laughs> <laughs> well, Madam Chair, would you have any questions? Um, yeah. So, th I think there's th there's a theme here that that I've heard a little bit throughout, and I think you kind of went went back to it, and that has to do with. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, whether it's here or abroad, um, they tend to be the, the, the super American agency that everybody wants to partner with um, because the way that they partner at home, they kind of take that, that set of um, ethics and interaction with them when they go into country. And so they, they work in partnership. They like, like, how do we solve a problem? They know how to, uh, you know, just really get get down get down to it with with the discussion how to interact with communities in that. So you uh, all kind of touched a little bit about you know and other other folks about how um, you know we get a big value for our dollar on that. But on the other side of that too is whether it's having uh, international logging or or illicit tr trophy hunting um, is customs. 
at, at airports in that. And one of the things that a lot of us, when we've been talking about whether it's national security or just you know lawbreakers, is is uh, U.S. Customs Enforcement. If you would take a, a second, and you've, you've you've got it in your testimony, but just reiterate to this community again um, how powerful it is to have um, fish and wildlife, um, not only working with customs here at our airports and and doing things to make sure that we're protecting everything from sea life to land land creatures and those who fly in the air, as to um, uh, what happens internationally because. Part of that is a conversation I'm going to have to have with the chair, um, and she knows it's coming, of Homeland Security. I've been talking a lot about, you know, invasive species, timber, and other things like that. So anything you want to add, add as far as customs and enforcement and U.S. Fish and Wildlife International? Can you hear me? Um, I think the Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Law, Law Enforcement is essential. Um, they do partner with um, uh, border and customs uh, officials as well as USDA. There's a lot of overlapping jurisdictions that make it somewhat confusing, um, but uh, it, it is essential as we see an increase in um, the illegal trade in wildlife and timber and wildlife parts into the U.S. Um, to you know, fully fund those those programs, but also work for for the best amount of um, integration. I know overseas the attaches are very um, involved and integrated into the embassies and missions. They work closely with the Department of Justice attaches that actually prosecute cases overseas. And in countries like Vietnam, for example, WCS works very closely, like with their CITES um, agencies. And this is exactly what we're doing. We're bringing together um, the Customs and Border Patrols, their Fish and Wildlife Service, their parks folks, and cross-training them um, so that they can comply with international laws, like the Convention on International Threatened and Endangered Species. And then we're taking it a step further, and we're, we're looking at where is a lot of trade from Vietnam coming from, and WCS has programs in most Mozambique in Africa and so we're doing um, similar to what both National Parks Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife Service we're doing exchanges of experts so that they can build those networks and know each other on each side of the, the um, trade chain um, but then also learn the expertise and understanding of what's happening in Vietnam as well as in Mozambique and even um, share intel so we um, were involved in Mozambique and found that there was someone who was arrested for trafficking um, in ivory, I believe, and thought that w was a low-level person. In communication with Vietnam, we realized they were actually like a kingpin, but he was portraying himself as just a mule. These types of exchanges of information, building relationships, and then also technical expertise uh, is what's going to help address this severe problem. Yes, thank you. Uh, just to briefly echo what Kelly said, we also in our written testimony requested an increase to the Office of Law Enforcement. We think that it's critical to maintaining U.S. global leadership in the conservation and wildlife trafficking arena. Uh, the attaches in particular are extremely useful in providing training and on-the-ground support in countries that have significant poaching crises and may be trying to export wildlife and wildlife products illegally to the United States and elsewhere in the world. Um, we would like to see funding increased to $85 million in FY20 in order to support those efforts and, as I say, uh, cement the global leadership that we have seen have a cascade effect, to echo someone's earlier comments, on the global stage in combating illegal wildlife trafficking and poaching. You told us a program you don't like. Is there a program you think that, that's effective? I think you need to deliver your message very, very articulately. Thank you. Is, is there something that the Humane Society, out of some of the programming that, that you, you got to sit through and listen through a lot of the, the testimony, is there anything that you're just like, we're, we're getting it right, we should do more of it? We absolutely support the Multinational Species Conservation Fund, the Office of Law Enforcement. So we are Office of International Affairs. We, we, we're, we're up there with, with, with them as well. <laughs> well, th thank you. And uh, 
thank you so much for your, your patience. Uh, your testimony is important. We were so glad that we got to have our public witness days today. Anything you'd like to add before we adjourn? Well, I just wanted to thank you for the acknowledgement of uh, my being elevated to the chair of ICCF along with Madam Chair and uh, uh, Henry Cuellar and, and Jeff Fortenberry. I gotta admit it was an eye-opening experience the first time I had the opportunity to go over to Botswana and you see the things that are going on there. It's one thing to hear about them, it's another thing to see them on television. It's quite another thing to be there firsthand. And it's uh, and I'm glad to see the, the, the progress that's being made uh, over there and the information that you received about them actually doing census of the elephants and the increase. You know, if we could only get them to continue to migrate along the, uh, uh, I, I cannot pronounce the name of that river for the life of me. Okay. Thank you, Okavanga. <laughs> 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 a lot of balls. <laughs> yeah, continue the migration. That would be great as well. But uh, all of you, thank you for what you're doing. And uh, no, I have no questions or anything at this time. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>